Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea, where each week we review records from artists. I would say two records from two artists, but we're reviewing many because this week was a motherfucker for releases, if you have been cognizant of anything, because we are going to be talking about, of course, the much anticipated, the new album, first album in five years from one Mr. Kendrick Lamar, the follow-up to Dan, Mr. Morale, and the Big Steppers, big double album. Also going to be talking about the new album from Tom York and Co, The Smile, Radiohead, whatever the fuck. We're talking about The Smile, A Light to Attract Attention, their new record. We're also going to be talking about two other new albums that you need to pay attention to that might have been overshadowed by those two releases this week. We're going to be talking about the also, long-awaited follow-up to uh, one of this podcast collective favorite uh, records, another favorite of Connor's, uh, which is the band Gospel, their new album, The Loser, which is also in tandem with a new album from an up-and-coming artist, Ethel Kane, the album Preacher's Daughter. We're going to be talking about all four of those. And for some of those segments this week, we are joined by... Returning guest, Adequate Emily, noted radio hey. head and Kendrick enjoyer. And Dave. <laughs> yes. I would, I would so, pull, my CDs are over there. That's the only thing I have, Radiohead, and physical copies of them. I've got the shirt, so it's fine. Well, yeah. You can I say have, like, a CDs nuts. How about Babu? We, we, uh, we, I think we were waiting for like the right where like, we really wanted to have Emily back on again. It's been ages since Emily was last time. We we're just waiting for the right episode. And then like you get a week where Kendrick Lamar and like two fifths of Radiohead, three, three sixths actually, if you count Nigel Godrich, release an album. And you know, it's it's kind of perfect for our sort of generation of younger millennials slash older Gen Zs. There, there we, we go. Are. Wow. Yes, this is signed. Wow. Signed? Holy shit. Damn. Wow. Oh, damn. He was giving away, was it the first month of the damn thing? If you bought it online, you could choose a CD or a vinyl package to get it with. And I chose CD very stupidly because I thought, <laughs> hey, I could I can transfer CDs onto physical uh, onto my did to digital and then I and then two years pass and I go, when am I ever gonna fucking do that ever again? No, no surface noise though. <laughs> CDs. Are, I don't even have a CD player anymore. CDs are that underrated. Is CDs regrettable. are uh, uh, the superior medium. But I'm, of course, you know what? But the Ray there's something uh, special TV about one of that. these. Yeah, I mean, this is the only vinyl I own, and I own nothing. It's nice to, play to have it on. a big square that's bigger than the small square, but I, I definitely prefer CDs. Why, personally. why does more bands other than Stephen Wilson and Porcupine Tree not do Blu uh, ray audio? That's the Blu ray audio, yeah. <laughs> No, the, the, the also I will say way... it's very fitting to own this on CD because this album cover does stream 2006. It does. <laughs> the only way to listen to music these days is Apple Music spatial audio. <laughs> <laughs> I will say when I first listened to uh, Love Supreme on Dolby Atmos, that is what it was made for. Like big band yeah. jazz albums where you can hear where it's coming from. Yeah. That John, is John, where that John Coltrane thing. definitely deliberately made a record for a company that didn't yet exist to remaster. Can we fucking <laughs> let's get started? All right. So <laughs> thank you, Mark. What have we been Anytime. listening to? Jake, why don't you tell us what you have been listening to for the last seven days? Well, each of us are going to have a bit of an abridged segment this week just because the, we have a lot to talk about and this has dominated most of our listening. However, I have listened to a lot of music this week. And one thing I want to shout out is that I finally kind of caught up with um, last year, one of the sort of biggest um, phenomenons that we were covering is the albums that came out of uh, the scene that the artist Paranol came from. The sort of uh, Paranol, they did that split uh, LP with Sonhos Tomam Kanta and uh, Asian Glow. Um, and Riley was espousing the, uh, the 
great qualities that all of these albums had uh, because they all had significant releases last year other than those particular albums that we covered. So I finally made it my uh, mission to sort of seek those out, listen to all of them because I just wanted to do that just because I mean, Paranormal is the only, the, the only artist of which I'm super duper familiar with. And much to my surprise, uh, I liked all of them. Um, I thought that Asian Glow's project last year, uh, Cole Fickle was uh, good, but not really for me, I guess. Uh, it just didn't have enough of the, the, the same similar striking sound that was on uh, the downfall of the Neon Youth. Um, and I listened to the Sonos Tomon Kanta project from last year, Hypnagogia, which I highly enjoyed. But the thing that uh, I enjoyed the most out of all of this, and I would say is my favorite project from this scene right now, which is Sonhos Tomam Kanta's album from this year, Maladaptive Daydreaming. Um, I, oh, I love this album. It's so good. Um, I, I've been listening to this basically every spare moment that I've had. Um, it's an incredibly ambitious combination of every possible sound that these guys have been uh, dealing in from, but even pulling from stuff even more extreme, stuff like black metal, stuff like that sort of really abrasive, noisy shoegaze that Paranormal was doing. And it's a really more adventurous record than Hypnagogia for me. Like that was a good album, but it was very safe for that sound. Whereas this takes a lot more risks. It does stuff with ambient, it does like, I mean, the, the, the black metal is really, really prominent. It reminded me a lot of one of my favorite black gaze groups, I'll say. Um, if you're a big fan of them, I'd say that you would heavily fuck with this album. It's definitely on the longer side, but I think it is immaculately paced. It's beautiful. The lyricism is fantastic. I absolutely cannot get enough of their singing voice. It is just an absolutely terrific, I would broadly label it as mostly like a black gaze project. Um, mm -hmm. if, if that world is interesting to you at all, if you like that really abrasive shoegaze that was on uh, to see the next part of the dream, that seems to be what they are embracing on this project most of all. Uh, and I welcome that heavily it's it's phenomenal it's yeah. climbed its way into my top 10 of the year also worth shouting out as well the artist behind San Hostum and Conta uh who goes by the name of Ella uh they are based in Brazil and are an example of one of many great sort of non-binary artists working in uh shoegaze and emo at the moment kind of bringing a particular queer character to this very fringe uh, variant of the and, and melding of these styles so if that interests you if you want to support between them and ethel kane my entire week has just been trans women are the future of music yeah. so i mean yeah so if you want to I support mean, i was gonna say it reminds me a lot of the queer uh the u.s queer emo scene that's happening right now with stuff like home is where yes and very uh, very weather, related well weather day's not american but you know what i mean yeah and, yeah that scene of like very fuzzed out emo that uh, glass glass speech that sort of goes into all these different genres and takes from all of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. I, I <laughs> what, what we're saying is uh, queers are awesome. If you're not, uh, we're we're coming for you. Uh, hide, <laughs> yeah. fuck up, you dead. The the homosexuals <laughs> will soon rule the world. It is our secret plot. Uh, We've moved on from pride. It's on to wrath. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh but yeah that that has been on heavy rotation this week so that's a new um 2022 release that i think more people definitely need to pay attention to just generally speaking i also listened to another uh new release uh this week which is from otoboke beaver um the album super champion uh, and I really loved Otopoki Beaver, Beaver's last album. It's just a really, it was a really succinct, really tight, really focused sort of uh, punk rock, noise rock, really just ass kicker of a record. And that's kind of why it's a bit disappointing to say that this is a release kind of let me down a little bit. This album is uh, 20 minutes-ish. And that's kind of like, I didn't really foresee that being an issue just because the, their other album is also like 34 minutes long. It's like nothing. And what happens is, is that the song structures here, they're like, there's a good number of songs on this album, is that they just never really develop. Like some of them just like, they, they kind of linger in a sort of a, a middle ground that just doesn't really suit this band very well. The sort of 
color and, and vibrancy and even the aggression is a little bit lesser. They kind of lean into like the math rock side of their sound, but it doesn't really work just because you can't really feel the lasting impact of these like tempo changes or these time signatures. Like it, it just doesn't ever feel like a, a project that it feels particularly substantial, I guess. I would still highly recommend checking out their previous album uh, before this though, just because it's great. Uh, and if you were disappointed by this uh, similarly to me, go check out the um, album that we covered early on this year. Uh, the, what is it, Giocho? Uh, yes, so Giocho's new album uh, is fantastic, uh, sort of math rock-esque. Uh, I, I would say slightly more sort of like clean and sort of uh, friendly than something Definitely. like Okay Beaver. But that new Joshua album is fantastic. I mean, other bands in that vein, like Trico put out a great album in December yeah. as well. Like, yeah, lots of awesome music happening in this kind of adjacent world. But yeah, I, mm -hmm. yeah, I wasn't particularly fond of the Otoboki Beaver record either. I only listened to it once though, so I didn't want to comment on it too much. But but yeah, it's still they're still a band worth following. They're still an incredibly charismatic band, and I have no doubt that their next their future records will still be worth checking out. Totally. Yeah, no, no reason to write them off completely. Okay, so what I've been listening to, I guess uh, I'll start it right off the bat with the oldest thing and work my way forward, starting in uh, 1967, because for whatever reason, I had, I had the inclination to listen to a Frank Sinatra album, uh, okay. particularly his collaboration with Antonio Carlos jobim i'm sure i'm getting that i sh i'm sure i've butchered that horribly but i don't really know what to say about this because it's very it's a very pleasant album but it is also completely toothless is the best way i could put it there's very little grit to it but i could listen to it again so it, it's in that weird middle ground of not for me but you know I that's the I record frame. with um girl from Ipanema on it, isn't it? That's a pretty great, yes, it is. That, that's a that is song. a good. I do like that track. That's definitely the highlight there. Frank Sinatra, not enough grit. Yeah, <laughs> bullshit. But the part of the reason I say that is because I listened to a better Sinatra this week, uh, Miss Nancy? Nancy Sinatra, and Lee Hazelwood's collaborative album, Nancy and Lee. Uh, this is kind of a country pop album with some really bizarre splashes of psychedelia thrown in there that make for a pretty catchy, really frenetic listening experience. And, and Lee yep. Hazelwood has this like notoriously kind of flat baritone voice that's contrasted perfectly by Nancy's just like soaring graceful angelic voice but in this album actually pretty good i kind of liked it i'm gonna be honest there were some fun fun tracks on here with some really and some of the more psychedelic flourishes are pretty tasteful actually there's some really good fusion of that kind of sonic aesthetic with the more kind of country aesthetics and kind of uh almost some jazzy aesthetics so it it's a light recommendation for me if it sounds passingly interesting to you. I'm not saying it was some mind-blowing record. It was just pretty good. But final thing, I, I listened to a uh, rising star in the podcast, it seems. Uh, the Moon is a Dead World by the band Gospel. And I have some mixed feelings on this album in that I think instrumentally it's all very good. I just never found it really stuck the landing for me. Like I listened to this three or four times and I, I just found myself really appreciating it, but at a constant like uncomfortable distance from it that leaves me unsatisfied, not only with the record itself, but my personal experience and that I feel I'm missing something. Maybe it just needs a month to sit and I can come back to it and I'll fully appreciate the brilliance on display here because there is plenty of brilliance. It just wasn't clicking for me at this time. 
I actually think that the new record, uh, well, for starters, I think you'll uh, like the I think you'll like the new record more. But I also I think that spending because the new record is just straight up a prog album, whereas this is just full on screaming yeah. and post hardcore. Yeah. But I think that also the new record might even give you help you to unlock the older one a little bit more because it presents a yeah. lot of what gospel do in a format and through a genre lens that I think will be more suited to your more tastes immediately. And, and I have listened to that new album and only heard it once so can't really have any definitive opinion on it yet but it did definitely strike a bit of a chord for me in places Mm. but i will say one thing i have to compliment this band synthesizers consistently amazing sounding so good it it makes me want to (laughs) come it's great (laughs) i'm glad you're that straightforward about it yeah yeah i mean for real though John Pestier is their keyboardist, and he is, I mean, he's great. On a, I mean, he's on one on the new one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, oh, we'll, yeah. we'll get into that shortly. Yes. No, that mm-hmm. keyboards on that sound great, but that's really what I've been listening to. Not a ton, because I've been busy as hell, but uh, yeah. All right, so this has been a really fucking crazy week for, for music, like an amazing week for great music. Which is why we're kind of having four discrete segments for four different albums that, you know, we're more or less contributing to, depending on whether we got to listen to them or what our feelings are. But still, like it was a stacked week. And yet still, still, there's albums that we're not covering formally today that came out last Friday that are fantastic. Well, there's one specifically, there may even be more that I haven't heard yet. I still want to listen to the Quelle Chris album. I haven't gotten around to that yet. Yeah, same. But one record that I want to shout out from an artist that I don't know if this podcast would expect me to be into this artist too much, but I've always had a fondness for this artist. My partner Andy is really, really into them. And the artist is Florence and the Machine. And Florence and the Machine have a new album out called Dance Fever. And it took me a while to get around to this just because I was so saturated with the glut of new albums. But I finally had some time to sit with this and listen to it a few times especially in the car where like it sounds fantastic and I will say I think this is a great fucking record definitely a return to form for Florence because I was not hot on their last record high as hope I thought that was a very underwhelming album this feels much more along the lines of what I want would want from this band has a lot of the the heft and drama of their best records it's also thematically an incredibly dark album a lot of it seems to be about uh kind of being in an abusive relationship or being in a relationship where there's kind of a certain level of mutual destruction perhaps like uh and and it's it adds a very dark tone to it uh although it also opens with a song called king which is like florence throwing out a non-binary trans mask anthem that i cannot recommend enough that song rules Um, But the whole album is stacked with absolute incredible highlights, songs like Free, songs like Dream Girl Evil, Cassandra is fantastic, Uh, my favorite one, uh, My Love, perfectly classic uh, Florence and the Machine song. Would you say this is a good album to get into them? Just because I've never like heard a Florence and the Machine song like ever. So the album you, you, are you, over. that's the thing is that you probably have though. You you have. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Look, this is their second best album, I think. But it, the one I would say to listen to is their best album, which is Ceremonials. And I guarantee okay. you put you'll put that album on and at least two or three of those songs you will have heard before. And you may have overlooked them because they're of radio saturation, but in context, they hit like a fucking truck. Ceremonials is one of the best pop records of the 2010s, I think. That album is just and the reason why it's so great is because it's fucking loud and in your face and just awesome. Now, Lungs, her, her debut, which is probably the most well-known of her records, is a, is a pretty good record too. Much more modest in sound and kind of folky, but it has a lot of great songs in it too. How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful is a really, really great record as well. I feel like a slightly underrated one, actually. That song has some massive tracks on it. But yeah, Dance Fever really struck me. It's grown on me. I think it's, yeah, second best record, closely followed by How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful. But yeah, Ceremonials, this album, they're both fantastic. Uh, There is an extent to which I think this band can kind of fade into the wallpaper they have and maybe have a certain one openness about them. But I think Florence has sufficient character and the songs have sufficient depth to kind of sidestep that. Uh, really, I think that High as Hope is the only time where they've ever, ever really fallen victim to that. 
But there's one thing this band is great at doing, which is making really loud, really anthemic, really in your face pop songs. And on records like this, on records like Ceremonials, on records like How Big, etc., they do that in spades. So yeah, uh, this band gets a hearty co-sign from me and the new album's really good. All right, well, let's get into our first review of the day. And first up is... This is an album that uh, me and Jake and Morgan have had a chance to listen to from a fantastic artist, a trans artist, Ethel Kane. Uh, and Jake, I'm going to let you really dominate on this one because this is an album that has come to kind of consume you. I know that, as a matter of fact. So why don't you talk about, first of all, who Ethel Kane is, what the concept of this album is, because it is very much a concept album, and oh, yes. what it has done to you. <laughs> Show us on the doll where the album hurt you. Oh, I will. Um, okay, so one thing that I didn't mention in my listening to this week is that after I heard Preacher's Daughter, I actually went and listened to basically everything Ethel has made thus far. Uh, her compilation of sort of unlike released uh, material are uh, as like the albums she's put out on Bandcamp before this, as well as two EPs, uh, which are uh, Inbred and I think like golden something but regardless they are good projects that feel like someone experimenting with a sound that they are good at but not necessarily something that they're trying to push any boundaries with uh i would say that ethel's sort of default sound goes a lot into shoegaze and slowcore and dream pop um, very singer-songwriter, tinged with kind of Americana and folk. It's a lot of different things, but it's a lot of things that work really, really well and really, really surprisingly cohesively when you kind of smush them all together. But that said, the projects that I listened to her before this record all kind of felt like they were sort of exercises. They were just kind of not necessarily experiments. I don't want to like demean those releases, but they are sort of feel like an artist testing the water. Uh, I mean, it's like we talked about with uh, Kendrick in our discography video about how, you know, he released two very long EPs before he released an album. And I kind of feel like that sort of, you know, just breaking your sound in is important for a lot of great artists. And so I think that that was done so that she could arrive fully formed here on Preacher's Daughter which is a concept and narrative album about Ethel, where she comes from, specifically her relationship with the various men in her life. Um, basically each and every song in like the first third of it is about a different man. Uh, this man could be her first boyfriend, her father, which is a recurring theme on the record, and uh, a man that she meets that takes her on the journey of the second half. Like this is a very narrative driven, like ABC, like movie, I would describe it as cinematic. And I knew nothing about this album. I knew nothing about Ethel Kane. I just knew that Riley put this on my radar and I wanted to listen to it just because it had a lot of comparisons to almost, uh, I, uh, one that I kept heard was sort of like Lingua Ignata-esque. Um, and that actually isn't an awful comparison, but my more taut focus is actually Chelsea Wolfe. It was also like Lin Lingua Ignata, but in her earlier career and a little bit in her later stuff, sort of focused on a folksier singer songwriter, uh, like aesthetic of kind of a, a gothic uh, Southern sound. And that kind of incorporated into her kind of ethereal wave tendencies, which this very much does. Uh, but it leads to this project being kind of singular and that I can't really ever compare any individual song to one thing. It's always multiple things. And I put this album on and I am not going to lie. I have had a very hard week. I have been, it, it has been very stressful. So it probably has something to do with that. But I put this album on and I sobbed. I got to the second song on this album, which is basically the most uplifting sounding thing here and it broke me. Basically just because it was one of the things, it basically this was like the Panopticon album last year of how when those fucking, that string section comes in on the end of something like Rope Burn Exit, 
where it was literally so so evocative, so beautiful and so powerful that a song without lyrical content in its present moment made me weep. That does not happen. It happened with Bethel Kane. And once I started on that second song, I did not stop. This is an emotionally ruinous album, despite the fact that it does have that second song, which is very like, honest to God, um, American Teenager, which is one of the many perfect songs on here that is vying for my favorite song of the year. This sounds like a Speak Now era Taylor Swift song, but like dream poppy to the nines. It's enormous. The guitars are huge. This is soaring. It is an impeccable piece of music and nothing else on this album sounds anything like it. It dabbles in the same genres, but the tone is all different. I mean, from the start, you have the intro family tree, which is like this haunting gothic sort of slathered in shoegaze. And like, it just sort of sets up the themes and the sounds. Like it also showcases how just spectacularly written this thing is. This is not, this is something that basically rides the line between being really emotionally blunt, really forthright, really uncomfortable and deeply kind of poetic metaphor shit that is just very hard on sleep. Not for everybody, but it, with music like this, that's so impactful and so focused on drowning you in its atmosphere, I found it utterly captivating. The line on the first song that still gets to me is, Jesus can always reject his father, but he can't escape his mother's blood, which is just, oh, God, like all of the like gothic shit on this album that sort of leans into that darker side is really, really kind of spellbinding to me. I, I love that kind of aesthetic in music and art and everything. Um, the, the chorus here says, you know, the uh, fate's already fucked me sideways, swinging by my neck from the family tree. His, and in reference to her father says, he'll laugh and say, you know, I raised you better than this, then leave me hanging so they can all laugh at me. It's, it's cruel and, and it's hard to listen to. And you can tell that Ethel had a very, very difficult upbringing. Uh, it, she goes into it on other songs like uh, Western Nights, which is uh, another song that's about one of Ethel's past lovers. The first leg of the album sort of goes through uh, the different boyfriends that she had. Um, and Western Nights is kind of something that echoes the problems that she had with her father. And it kind of ties into what makes these parallels between these men so uh, arresting for her. Um, it pre, it like if the previous song, House in Nebraska showcased like her gravitating towards a man who embodied how uh, like warm they could be. This is her falling into the trap of someone who embodies everything cold and abusive about her father. So everything sort of keeps getting tied back into this core as you keep going onward. It's this, this web that just keeps kind of spinning outward and outward and it makes everything feel so at peace with each other. And I kind of skipped over a house in Nebraska just because this is, again, this is a song that just like, I think the last time the song fucked me up this much is probably Chinese Satellite by Phoebe Bridgers where the first time I heard it, I just kind of stopped in place and like cried. Uh, and this has a similar moment on it, frankly. Um, it's uh, the part where she, like, she's just sort of pleading. And there's one lyric where it says, you told me that if we died tonight, that I'd die yours. And then later I'd kill myself just to hold you one more time. You were the one person I was never scared to tell that I hurt. So she has like this persona that's like really hard edged and toughened by the world and by addiction and by all of these things but she really peels back the vulnerability on songs like House in Nebraska, which has this beautiful kind of piano ballad quality to it that's just utterly fucking gorgeous. The, I can't stress enough how beautiful just her singing voice is. It's dynamic in that it can be very lilting, very fragile, very quiet, but when she wants to get up and scrape against the tip of her register, it is some of the most chilling shit I have heard on anything this year or anything any year, frankly. And House in Nebraska is just, it's just describing this shitty little house that she lived in with her boyfriend and how it meant everything to her, even though it was awful and she didn't even technically like being there. And she just sort of paints these portraits of environments and the people that inhabit them. And it does it so well. And then 
go back to Western Nights, there's like a sickly haunted feeling to this sort of shoegazy track that just, she just, she can't help but express how she still misses the security that her father gave her, but still is kind of trapped up in the fact that he abused her and the, like how complicated that feeling is. Uh, the, the moment in Western Nights that kills me is just when she talks about crying in the middle of the night and looking at TV static. It's just such a despondent fucking image. It, it like rattles me. Mm-hmm. And then there's the reprisal of Family Tree, which uh, talks about her, like her previous boyfriend from the other song dies in a shootout and then she goes on her own. And this song is so like, this is super Chelsea Wolf, gothic, mythic Americana vibe here, really staunchly maintained. Got lyrics like, baby, hell doesn't scare me. I've been times before, but the conviction with which she delivers it, you fucking believe it. The woozy synths in the second half of this, this whole part of the record, the middle stretch here, it almost feels like a, a, a journey that you're going on with Evel as she goes across the Western United States and like runs away. It feels like a gothic shoegaze, lonesome crowded West. Mm. It's so fucking like, there's just nothing that sounds quite like this. And then there's Hard Times, which is a song where Ethel recalls her childhood, specifically in reference to when she was sexually abused. It is utterly heartbreaking. I cannot read many of these lyrics because they are too much for me to do, Mm. but they're gently sung by Ethel. And it's an experience in and of itself just to hear someone say these things with this amount of conviction. Uh, One of the most heartbreaking lines being in the corner on my birthday, you watched me dancing there in the grass. Uh, I was too young to notice that some types of love could be bad, praying that I'd be like you doing all the things that you do and I still do and that scares me. So it's not just that these things are heartbreaking and evocative of a particular experience, but they are evocative of a complicated experience of something that she is still in the middle of trying to unravel. And that simplicity is just never here. Everything on here is so three-dimensional. And like the, the, the end of hard times where it's just, oh. it's the most taxing thing to listen to. It's just her over and over and over again saying i'm too tired to move and too tired to leave over and that, over that fucking over. that shit the end of that song like it yeah. uses its longer song lengths so well not just because it's gorgeous and big and every track on here sounds like a million fucking dollars but you really do stay in these specific environments from these songs and none of them feel similar at all and then after that you get the fucking cloud parting sunshine light of thoroughfare which is a much needed bright spot on the album that just kind of seamlessly continues the story of ethel finding and meeting a new man who she travels with that who actually seems somewhat decent and she gives us details about him that make us feel like she might end up with somebody worthwhile the instrumental tone here is way lighter way bouncier it's a really endearing song about the development of their relationship and it's like a breath of fresh air all nine minutes of it feel relieving and they perfectly evoke a road trip across the west and ethel's performance here is fantastic she rises with intensity until the explosive ending and then at the very end there's like this two minute section where it just kind of carefully just sort of breaks into this like stripped back scatting and tambourine section where she just kind of gets to let loose and it actually kind of reminds me of this year's big thief album uh dragon new war mountain i believe in you it just feels like it has that sort of carefree bounciness and vibe and togetherness that really sells the emotionality of this song and then after that you get gibson girl which goes right back into the darkness because it turns out that this man that she's with like all of the other men in her life just want to use her uh this track is named after the painter charles dana gibson an american painter who has said to draw women who are considered the pinnacle of beauty standards and this is dark and smoky and nocturnal where the deep side of ethel's vocal register is used to amazing effect uh she discovers that the new man is just as willing to exploit her as the last and she has to sell her body so that they can have money. Uh, and that often leads her to violent men who abuse her and he convinces her that it's all for the best. Uh, the downtuned guitars on this song are like Pink Floyd-esque. It's utterly like spellbinding, but the moment that I think really sealed the deal for me on this album and just how unique it was and how much I loved it is the ninth song, uh, Ptolemaea. This is the most unnerving, 
horrific piece of music I've heard all year. Once again, really evoking the darker parts of the catalog of Chelsea Wolf. Uh, the narrative takes a turn where the drugs that she and her boyfriend Isaiah are on make her hallucinate. And this drug addled hallucination speaks to Ethel as like the embodiment of sexual violence and hate and power and masculinity. And you can hear the distorted sounds of flies buzzing around the first part of the song. Ethel's really fragile, soft voice is more intimate than it has been on the whole record. And it's describing this like wolf-like God surrounded by supernatural light as she like catches fire in this hallucination. And she describes looking at him, feeling him stare into her and begs and pleads for it to stop. And she like normally kind of whispers this insistent stop, stop, stop. And then just fucking screams it. And it's harrowing. Every time I hear this, I get chills. It, it's, it's just so fucking powerful the way, the way her and, voice distorts on that and then kind of just clips out like as if it's being kind of like cut like the the, the it, feed is just being cut from her voice and you just get oh it's that shit is it's traumatic legitimately like one of the moments on like where i'm just robbed of words and then the final leg of this is something i don't really have particular thoughts on because it follows by two instrumentals, August Underground and Televangelism, which sort of symbolize Ethel coming out of her sort of drug-addled stupor and then eventually being killed by her boyfriend and then uh, ultimately mutilated by him. And it takes place from her departed spirit looking onward in the final two songs, Sun Bleached Flies and Strangers, which I mean, Sun Bleach Flies is probably my front runner for the best song on here. It's the biggest, it's yeah. the most explosive, it's the most emotional, it's the most moving. It's her laser focused on her life and her regrets and wanting to go back to a simpler time before all of this stuff happened. And all of it is nostalgic and all of it is difficult. And it is so, so beautiful. It is so powerful there is nothing that sounds bigger like i've heard metal albums that don't have as much power as the second half of sun bleach flies and same with strangers really it has it continues that exact same tone as she hones in on speaking to her mother uh ending the album on sort of like you know i miss you mom i'll see you when you get here and like i got it i i've listened to this at least twice every single day despite the fact that it's been emotionally devastating to me each and every time I, it's genuinely very hard to even talk about but I get so lost inside of this that no matter how dark and frightening that it is I don't want it to end it's so cinematic and big and it feels immediate and tactile in a way a lot of shoegaze doesn't a lot of it kind of abandons its sense of weight but this doesn't and it's all self-produced which is nuts. Yeah. I feel like I've been to the places that Ethel sings about. I've met the people she talks about. I felt a lot of these feelings. And thankfully, a lot of the feelings here are also very alien to me, but it mm. still managed to give me this sense of finality and closure. It encompasses so many sounds, all of which are up my alley and distills them into a record and experience that is immersive in ways that I've never felt before with music. I am exhausted in the best way at the end, at the end of this album, at the end of this very long record, but in a way that makes me feel like all of my baggage and past has been wiped away and gives me a newfound clarity. I think that Ethel has a stunning voice in a literal sense, but also in a creative sense. And this is a staggering work that I think could be the fan foundation of a really unique, really outstanding career. And I want to be here for it. It is a difficult album that is maximal and long and heavy and often overbearing, but that is all to its benefit. It is gorgeous front to back. It's an utter achievement. It's self-produced by a musician who deserves more love. And it felt as though it exercised something out of me. And as awesome as it feels to have an album that was like, feels like it was made for me, both sonically and conceptually, so many things I love about music are here. I know I'm not gonna be the only person who loves it. So please, in a week, like this crowded by great releases from great artists that we will still talk about and give their due praise. Please, 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 I implore you, do not forget about Ethel Kane. Mm. Uh, this you're talking about it has is... already sold me that I am so disappointed I didn't have the time to listen to it. I, it's I, a record that I takes time to absorb, had, for sure. I had to sell this and sell it hard on a video I know was going to get a lot of attention. I, I, I just can't 
say enough good things about this. Uh, the final, I think my favorite lyric on this album that distills its essence so perfectly is in one of those final songs. And it's God loves you, but not enough to save you. So good luck being on your own. And there's something very pessimistic about it, but I can't help but glean a bit of hope from it somehow. So there's please, God, the, listen to it. One of the things that I found most kind of fascinating about the record, I mean, you've spoken beautifully on basically all of it, but uh, the relationship with the character, because I believe Ethel Kane is a stage name, the name of the character and yes. the story, it's a fictionalized story, but you know, we don't know the extent to which it's adopted from uh, the real life experiences of the fantastically named Hayden Anhedonia, which is her real name. <laughs> And that's like, that's an amazing name. Um, but yes, going professionally by Ethel Kane. And um, one of the things that's so fascinating about this record is the relationship between this character of Ethel Kane and Christianity, obviously, the religious upbringing, uh, the, the specific kind of manifestation of Christianity in the, you know, in this kind of American heartland sort of lo location, this kind of like fundamentalist sort of feel. But like, how complicated Ethel's relationship with Christianity is, uh, how it kind of doesn't seem to be kind of clear or easy to understand throughout the record. I mean, the end of the album essentially, you know, whether literally or not, ends with her ascension to heaven, right? Or her ascension to another plane, essentially, beyond death, like an afterlife, essentially. And the, you know, she doesn't kind of like give you a, a thesis on what that means or how that's reconciled with her religious beliefs, but the fact that uh, Ethel persists beyond her death and ends in this kind of transcendental state is like, you know, it's fascinating to reconcile with the earlier uh, comment commentaries and, and statements about, about Christianity and about afterlife and about heaven and hell and that sort of thing. It kind of reminds me a bit of uh, how someone like, Ling as we mentioned, Lingua Ignata talks about religion, where it's kind of not directly christianity it's like a critique of it but it's like forming its own it's metaphysical like secularized it. christianity if that even makes sense it's, it's like an it's appropriation christianity. of christianity yeah. symbols and feelings into a form of meditation on the self and self psychology yeah. if i would say that i don't think either artist is like religious but i would say both of them are someone who has been through a religious background and is taking from it Most assuredly. to meta to metaphorize their mm. uh well, it's something that we have actually observed in a number of um, trans artists. I mean, Hunter Hunt Hendricks of liter Liturgy also comes to mind here as well. Not that, not, yeah, not that Christian yeah, Hager yes. is trans, obviously, but like there's a lot of queer artists who do talk about the ways in which certain fundamental aspects of religion that are, are so co-opted by and, and coded in like the fundamental hypocrisies of organized Christianity. And there's an attempt mm. to kind of reclaim a lot of those aspects of spirituality, of belief, of God, of transcendence, essentially. The idea of transcendence, the idea of, you know, there being a, a plane beyond the physical form is obviously one that's very potent and powerful to a lot of trans artists and people in general. And so you get that idea funneled a lot more into a kind of personalized religious framework in a lot of these works. And I think this is a great example of that. It's also definitely a protest of how it's been weaponized against queer people as well. I mean, I mentioned backwash. Backwash has been the most like use used like sort of using Christianity to basically as this sigil of like God hating and torturing people through bigotry. Mm. And it's something that's very interesting because I heard with the discussion of this album, it sounded like there was a lot of very similar themes being discussed. Mm. Well, it's interesting as well because if you think about like, like, like all of these different visions of like Chris of like uh, belief in a god, whether you want to think of it as Christianity or not, like they manifest in different ways with these different artists. Like you think about liturgy, right? The whole thing with Hunter is God is love, right? Like God is this is this embodiment of transcendental euphoria, essentially that you kind of uh, that you sort of aim to embody she embraces it the most for sure she and, embraces the and god is like a god is like uh an idea of total kind of euphoria that you aim to reach through like studying and through meditation and through like transcendental kabbalah as she calls it like there and there's so, so there's lots of these alternative manifestations of spirituality that are coming through more and more in art and i think i uh, make for a really interesting 
you know, uh, interesting things to talk about. Interesting I, things to think about. I, I will also make the comment that it is very funny of all the artists that we mentioned. The one that is the kind that has the most kind, gentle view of Christianity is the black metal artist. Right. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> it's interesting, like, because it, it always felt like Hunter's, the way that Hunter's incorporated black metal has kind of been deliberately a, a subversion of everything that it is. Oh, yeah. Um, but you're right. It's the only Christ album that involves, black metal album that contains Christian themes that the, that the black metal, the true cult heads can occasionally enjoy if they're not too up their own asses being Nazis. Well, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That's a lot. Shout out to the true cult black metal heads who are not Nazis. They exist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, they Morgan, I know you listened to this album this week as well. I'm curious, you know, what you were expecting and how you Southern felt. Southern Gothic bully. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, listening to this was a sort of similar experience to when we did the uh, Proto Martyr album ultimate success today <laughs> i know in, you're going with this already in yeah. july of 2020 where that album uh cripplingly depressed me to such a degree that i listened to it once and then just sat out the episode i haven't gone back to that one since you know i suspect it'll be a similar story with this it's, it goes without saying i think that the album is really good american teenager is the obvious standout for me and probably the only wow. thing on it that doesn't make me want to end my life. In particular, really enjoy the guitar line that if it isn't straight up lifted from Journeys Don't Stop Believing, I like I it's know exactly close enough the to, one. Yeah. yeah. Like oh, kind so of good. like that bit it's in uh, on Metallica's I forget which song it is on Kill 'em All, but their one calls it the Sweet Home Alabama riff. I imagine it's that sort of like thing where it's like it's so similar, but it's not exact. But everyone's gonna always hear it every single time. It's close well, enough. The yeah. funny, like, yeah. <laughs> everyone talks about the Sweet Home Alabama riff, but that's always been the Werewolves of London riff to me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, six one, um, one half dozen of you. Who who's kid, who's uh, it? Kid, the kid All Rock. Summer Long by Kid Rock riff. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Anyway. Here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really powerful statement of an album that is appropriately difficult to get through, uh, despite even its euphoric moments. Uh, 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 Ptolemaea was also a standout to me, uh, particularly in how it made me want to go to bed and never get out of it. <laughs> um, uh... It's definitely a worthwhile experience, but it was it was only it's, it's something I will only experience once because, uh, God, that, that I think is an essential part of the experience to this is that there are some people who are just going to listen to this and they're going to appreciate it musically and they're going to on some level enjoy it, but it is going to be too much for a lot of people. I know I talk about getting emotional when I listen to music a lot. But when I tell you I sat here on this bed when I listened to it at first and just like wept like a small child for about an hour straight, I, I did. And it, it, it she has an amazing voice weirdly. as well. I feel like we haven't emphasized that enough. How, how stunning her voice is. Unbelievably yeah. pretty. Like, like what I, the fuck, dude? I'm, I'm, I really hope her next album is listenable. <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Just I for know that, that reason. I know that like at least a thousand different trans women are going to be in Ethel's DMs demanding to know who her vocal coach is and like who, <laughs> we, how she where she got her vocal training because like it is the oh, most real. astounding voice. I might I, be one of them. <laughs> all right, let's rate this thing. <laughs> Ethel Kane, preacher's daughter. Um, I'll go first this time. Uh, my three favorite tracks are. Sun Bleach Flies, Song of the Year contender, unquestionably. Thorough Fear, which is an amazing centerpiece to this record and just an absolute uh, trip through the heartland of America and the loss of innocence to just use some fucking cliches. And I 
we'll shout out the biggest grower on this record and, and Jake was helpful in me really paying attention to the song coming to fully appreciate it, which is a house in Nebraska. Can I just say God. the fucking guitar, when the guitar, when the electric guitar comes in at the end of this, like when you think the song has gotten as beautiful as it could possibly be and then the just sort of electric guitar soloing comes in and it just completely, it's like the roof is torn off of your house, of this Nebraskan house and you're seeing she all of the stuff. She does that like eight times on this album where she's just like, oh, you thought I was done? You fucking thought... Yeah, least favorite track. I don't have one. Uh, maybe I guess the intro, but it's kind of it sets the scene really nicely. Uh, the album gets. I I know this is gonna be a nine very soon, so I'm just gonna say it now uh, because it's not quite there yet. But I I just know that it will be. I I know that for a fact. So it's I'm gonna give it a nine. It's a stunning, stunning record. Three favorites. Sad out of ten. Uh, American teenager hard times and Ptolemy. least favorite uh, it's, i mean who cares uh i'll give this an eight out of ten all right and jake oh riding high uh i, I you know picking three songs feels like a futile fucking effort considering i would deem most of these perfect songs and legitimately if you're wondering what's the song from this album that's gonna end up on your top 10 of the year i don't know like seriously <laughs> it could be any of them so right now i guess i'll just say the ones that i love the most are american teenager thoroughfare and <clears throat> sun bleached flies um least favorite track there is nothing here that is anything short of masterful i give it for the first fucking time this year on a main episode 10 out of 10 all my love to Shape of Despair's uh, Return to the Void, my other perfect score for this year, but sorry, trans women are better. Oops. Hot take on this podcast. All right, that means <laughs> we get an average of 9.0 for Ethel Kane's oh. Preacher's Daughter. All right, let's move on to our second review of the day. This will be a little bit shorter, but no less effusive in praise. Gospels the Loser. So, Gospel are a post hardcore slash screamo band. They came out of nowhere, a uh, New York band, dropped a classic in 2005, The Incredible The Moon is a Dead World, which Connor will tell you, which I will tell you, which most people who aren't August who've listened to it will tell you, is essentially a genre classic. It, it is not only like a super unique album for a post hardcore record. It's incredibly musically sophisticated as well. Like the arrangements are totally unconventional. Uh, I think I might've compared them like to, like what Gore Guts do for death metal is kind of what gospel do for post hardcore. And that record is so seminal and so brilliant and, and creative and inventive and exciting. But as August attested to in the, what we've been listening to, it's a record that's so intense and like furious and so like, unconventional in some of its structures that it could quite possibly leave you cold if it's not something you're acclimatized to. However, the new album, The Loser, which is their first album in 16 years, an incredibly long awaited follow up to an amazing debut record. And I can understand why, right? When you drop an album like that, and it's and a Kendrick and it's fans a, thought five years was long. It's a really tight record too. Yeah. So you can understand this is a band that really cares about quality control and doesn't want to put out anything that's excessively baggy or uh, unnecessary. And so you come back with a new record, uh, eight tracks, 40 minutes, all killer, no filler, the loser. And the biggest th thing to note about this record is that it's not necessarily a complete departure from post-hardcore, but it is a very strong embrace of prog rock and prog metal, I suppose, more to be more yeah. accurate, because this is still a metal record, but it integrates elements of prog that are so like rooted in like the fundamental sort of 70s prog. Like it's the most a prog metal band has ever sounded like yes to me in terms of like how yeah. intense the keyboards are, the synthesizers, like there's elements of yes, there's elements of rush, there's elements of, of all kinds of classic rock in here to a certain extent, but they're synthesized into these incredibly intense metal arrangements that just bat you around like a cat with a fucking mouse and you just have to sit there and take it. Like Jake, Morgan, what was this album uh, like to experience for you guys? Hot take, I guess. I like this more than The Moon is a Dead World, which is an album I really fucking enjoy. If if, you, if you're finding the appeal of this band or these albums somewhat elusive, 
fans of at the drive-in, I think, will be very much at home here. Not that it's to say that it sounds overwhelmingly like them. I just think that the genre sensibilities are very similar. Or the thing that this is more uh, applicable to is that the a moon is a dead world is more of a relationship of command. Whereas this this scratches my Mars Volta ish itch like nothing has in like the past ten years. Um, and that is to say, it's not wholly comparable to that, just only enough. And that's kind of the, the sauce with this album is that every single part of it, melding with the other aspects of it, create this end product that is so exciting. This is the most dynamic kind of just technically impeccable showcase of post-hardcore and uh, progressive metal I've heard in so long. And like Riley said, it is vacuum sealed. It is airtight. There's nothing here that is anything short of some of the best stuff you will hear in this entire genre. That is a promise. Uh, I think that like, basically it's a whirlwind that like never really ever stops moving. And I think the, there's plenty of things to say about it that make it stick out from basically its predecessor and its genre uh, sort of contemporaries. Like Bravo, the opener, like it almost begins with a kind of kitschy, cheap sounding like church organ almost. And like the opening scream where the vocalist is like, ah, like just kind of rising up gradually. And then he just screams, I feel so alive. You are on one. And it just, it kicks the door down so quickly. It's fucking ballistic. The drummer on this album, he is doing fills between fills between fills. This guy is nuts. This is jazz drumming. This and the quintessentially alien sounding guitar tones from their previous album are all over this. And this is just a perfect song and album to just scream along to, even if you don't even know the lyrics, just to say, fuck it. It's cathartic as hell. And honestly, I have nothing but good things to say about every track that follows it too. Uh, highlights for me are the unbelievably impeccable SRO which starts out with synths that wouldn't be out of place on like a space ambient album before the guitars just fucking howl into this song. And the lyrics here, which I think are honestly real well put together, they're disorienting and dissociative and the, the squall of noise at the center of this song make it sound like nothing I've ever heard before. The delivery is like very um, uh, Daughters-esque uh, which it really works for all this. The way it's all mixed sounds like he's desperate to overpower the mix around him, which creates a kind of cloying sort of like constant panic that the singer sounds like that he's in to try and match the song. And it, fuck me, it just adds so much desperation. The song is nonstop. It's a lethal beat down. The chords that kick off the final third are inhuman. Then there are woodwinds. Humans did not make this song. Uh, I love how Tango sounds like it could be a B-side right off of d Laust and the Comatorium. I think Metallic Olives is like the most dynamic song here, part mid-90s prog, part early 2000s post-hardcore. And the guitar tones and the slower moments have this kind of bluesy affectation and sparkly synths. And hell, the middle of this song with the fucking uh, the synth tones, this reminds me of Richard Barbieri playing on a 2000s Porcupine Tree album lead singer loses his mind at the end of this song and it's the the guitars sound like they were plucked right off of the thin ice or just wall era david gilmore in general uh warm bed just kind of the closer is like this it, it it is just so disarming in how strange these tones are and then it's an incredible rise and fall to the album and it just leaves you utterly winded and exhausted by the end of it the fucking... it's so so good the fucking keys on warm bed are like i think i said this they're like the key the, the keyboard tones the warmth of the keyboard tones on that closing track straight off of shine on you crazy diamond from wish you were oh there. yeah like yeah, it's yeah. the exact same sort of richard wright keyboard tone and it's amazing and it's like the keyboards all over this album are amazing that particular tone is only on that song but you have like I love how overpowering the organ tones can be and the key tones can be at certain points in time. One of the things that I think will endear this to people who like a good bit of prog music that can maybe get a bit fatigued by how 
uh, relentless it can all be, is the instrumental variety and variation on this record. The combinations of sounds is super, super unique, super, super refreshing, and it never really gets stale either. And it's so tight, as you said, that it's it's it doesn't have enough time to kind of become one note, even if it is all very aesthetically unified. No you have that intensity kind of matched and, and kept on this level. I think fans of Dillinger Escape Plan will enjoy the level of intensity that this band oh, musters yeah. up as well in a lot of ways too. Like fans of like mathcore and metalcore and stuff, but just also it's for the person who wants to get into metalcore, but has a real strong sort of prog rock um, backing. Like I think this is a gospel or a kind of a quite underground band. And I don't see this album kind of accruing any kind of like uh, mainstream alternative music media cred it's not really getting picked up at all because i think gospel don't really have much of a a, a well-known name to themselves but i could see this being a real sort of uh an album that really connects with people who are looking to get into more extreme forms of music from the standpoint of being really into bands like yes and pink floyd and that sort of stuff because it really pushes you in there but gives you enough familiar aesthetic stuff to ground you and on that note Morgan, I'd love to hear what you think of this record as well as someone who was kind of just told to listen to this without a huge amount Post of context. Poor boy himself. But you do have a lot of uh, a lot of love for a lot of stuff that's like this. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, if you enjoy extreme music, this is necessary, and particularly if you have a real ear for the more extreme sides, the more progressive sides of music and uh, hardcore and post-hardcore. This is a record that I'm only hesitating to give a perfect score to because I've heard it uh, twice and this is a very stacked week with more dense albums around it. Dense in the sense of discussion, not musically, uh, because this plays like an uh, 80 minute album on 2x speed so you know there's a lot of unpacking to do but good lord no, few things have ever felt so immediately seminal lately mm. there's like a good mix of songs on here that like are well, prog metal fans who like really like the sophisticated st styles and structures will enjoy songs like sro uh songs like metallic olives but there's also songs on here that have this kind of like almost single-esque quality, songs like Dear Ghost, for instance, that feel like they've been ah. really accessible. I think if you want a taste of this record, you don't want to dive into the whole thing, listen to Dear Ghost. It's basically the, one of the shortest songs on the record, and I think it's one of the most immediate as well. And that'll give you a taste yeah. of the whole thing, really. But there's lots of surprises on here. There's lots of uh, beautiful moments of, of stunning clarity and of melodic bliss, but also such intensity. Uh, it's... It really kind of is the whole kit and caboodle. Like it's everything you could really want. There's something of that in here. It really lights a fire under my ass because like for as, you know, a genre that's called progressive metal and what have you, or even post-hardcore, it's like, this is a genre that's kind of had its heyday in terms of the actual degree to which it is progressive or can be considered a progressive sound. And so it's easy to kind of pastiche this and just sound like older bands. This is one of the few modern prog releases that I feel like genuinely pushes the boundaries of what modern contemporary progressive metal could even be considered as. Mm. So I like... <sighs> yeah, I, look, I didn't think anything could possibly dethrone uh, Diaspora Problems from Soul Glow as my favorite hardcore release of the year. But yeah. I mean, this is basically neck and neck with that on my um, albums of the year list. It's, yeah, it's, just beat it out for me. It's super, super great. So yeah, check it out. Three favorite songs on here are gonna go with um, Metallic Olives, uh, gonna go with SRO, and I'm gonna go with, uh, I'm gonna say Hyper. Um, there's some like ELO space rock shit on this song that is just so fucking good. Uh, love it a lot. Uh, my least favorite song on here, it's funny just because it's like, my least favorite song on here is White Spaces. And the reason that it is my least favorite is because I have this written, uh, it instrumentally, it is the only song on here that rises to being sensational rather than godly. And it's a great fucking song, has a lot of great like tangible lyricism about the exploitation of people in power and workers and what have you, but it doesn't quite edge out to the masterfulness of the rest of the record. But when your worst song is amazing, you're good. 
uh, confident nine out of 10 for this. Beautiful. All right, uh, Morgan. Uh, yeah, my three favorites, I will say Hyper, SRO, and Tango, giving this the hearty nine and a half. Uh, my three Let's favorite go. tracks are SRO, Hyper, and Metallic Olives. Least favorite track, uh, probably White Spaces, but that's a great fucking song, so it doesn't mean much. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I'm giving this a 9.5 as well. It's it's right up there with the best records of this year. I mean, it's a fucking amazing oh week between this and Ethel Kane, like both of those being 9 out of 10s, and then we've got, spoiler alert, another 9 out of 10 coming next week from me. Good, good, good time to be alive and listening to music. That gives us an average of 9.3 for Gospels The Loser. Uh -huh. All right. Now, Emily can be welcomed back into I'm the fold for music <laughs> that she's actually listened to. As we talk about our two kind of big, high-profile releases of the week, we're going to start off with... <music> the new record from The Smile, A Light for Attracting Attention. Now as Jake mentioned at the head of this episode. And as you probably already know, The Smile is a side project of a couple of guys you may, hear, may have heard of, Tom York and Johnny Greenwood, alongside the drummer from the fantastic uh, fusion jazz band, Sons of Kemet, Tom Skinner. Uh, and of course, with the kind of uh, George Martin of Radiohead, Nigel Godrich as well, along the way to help make this record sound the way that it does. You have what is essentially now, I've, I've seen a lot of people and I'm not saying this is necessarily a, a, a wrong thing to say, but a lot of people have essentially said this is just basically the 10th Radiohead album. To a certain extent, I get it. There's a lot about it that's very Radiohead-esque. Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind I of would, a I bit would. cruel to say call anything that Colin Greenwood, Phil Selway, and especially Ed O'Brien are not on uh, a Radiohead yeah. album, essentially. But yeah. this will, as has been said by many before me, fill a certain itch, fill a certain spot that Radiohead fans will probably need filling given that their last album was six years ago. And it's very unclear whether we'll ever get another one. In the sense uh, that the smile and Radiohead, it's like, I agree with everything Riley just said. It's just that the trouble here is that the appeal, the Venn diagram of fans of the smile and Radiohead fans is not a Venn diagram. It is a circle. There, well, yeah. there is nothing about <laughs> the, this that is not appealing to Radiohead fans. And the thing is, like, but, it kind of another reason why you could make that link is that there's a lot of about it sonically that kind of feels like it doesn't necessarily pick up where a moonshape pool left off, but it takes elements of that record, particularly the increasing focus of jazz as an influence on Radiohead, right? Yeah, which is which yeah. became quite pronounced with the King of Limbs and then a moonshaped pool in the 2010s. And I think it's even more pronounced here, not least because this record has a jazz drummer on it. And yeah. you have songs that take a lot more from the influence of, of jazz and of fusion jazz, not only in the drumming, but of course in the guitar playing as well. You have these kind of you know, sort of angular, but very kind of like liquidy and sort of like um, melty sort of textures and tones. You have bass parts on this record that are incredibly kind of like muscular, but also sort of like uh, kind of irreverent and floaty as well. They kind of like dance, you kind of dance around with them and stuff. Like there's a lot that's, you know, I think that, it might be easy to use words like formless, but I think that kind of belies how much kind of complexity and musical sophistication is actually going on on this record. Uh, it's just that a lot of it is in this very sort of atmospheric space where you do kind of just let melt into it a little bit. But yeah, uh, I think it's probably most fair, Emily, to let you speak for us on this since we've had you sitting here while we talk a little bit about other records. So I'm curious what your expectations were for this and how it kind of uh, how you kind of feel about it now that it's out and you've been able to sit with it for a bit. It's very interesting because I, the best, you mentioned like the Venn diagram of it being a circle and everything. The interesting thing about The Smile, I would say is like, it's an album that I wouldn't say sounds like a new Radiohead album, but if you were to put a bunch of these songs in a playlist with a bunch of Radiohead songs, they would not stick out at all. The thing I will say about that is, as I think everyone will say, the Smile's never going to have its own legacy separate from Radiohead. It will always kind of live in its shadow. And that's just going to be the yeah. thing. And I mean, but, yeah, the, the, like, it is inescapable that some of these were Radiohead songs at some point. Yes, yes. good yeah. point. I was going to mention that. Yeah, I, but I will say the thing that's interesting and the reason why I would say it's not exactly a Radiohead album is there's something very improvisational about it. It feels 
this feels the most I will say this is both a positive and a negative for the album. It feels the most like a jam session in a way. Like they wrote these songs and this is like them playing through all of them. It's not a very conceptual record. It is the most collection of songs. I think you could call a Project Hey by Tom York and Johnny Greenwood. It's a great collection of songs, but I would not say it's like this through line storyline that you could get with something like a Moonshape Pool. Sure. Where like, it, it and that's a but that's the thing that also gives it this loose fun energy of like these are these people that are clearly haven't really like met in the last year and are creating something fresh from their minds that they can go all right this is something slightly different from something we can do but we can experiment in ways that we maybe wouldn't have to we would have to avoid with the pressure of this radiohead name on us mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. Uh, it reminded me a lot of Anima, the last Tom York solo record. Yeah. Which I still think I like. I still think I like a little bit better than this because it's just very tight and very cohesive and, and sharp. But this is obviously going for something very different. Like you say, it has this kind of languorous feel to it. It has this jammy feel to it. And that, I think, is something that Radiohead rarely, if ever, allow themselves to indulge in. The thing is, like, Radiohead songs... I mean, the band have been on the record and you can hear this in the way their songs evolve in their live performances. Radiohead songs are often like a product of jamming, the product of kind of like working through ideas. And because of the level of quality control in Radiohead and because of the demands of that project and their desire to release incredibly tight and perfected songs, the Radiohead records take a long time and Radiohead records can be tedious to make because they're so focused on doing that. Whereas here, it's like the process may be somewhat similar to how songs on records like A Moon Shape Pool may have come together. But the difference is they're allowing themselves the freedom to not be as pedantic and soul draining and crushing as often the experience of making a Radiohead record is. They're allowing themselves to let songs just breathe and not have to be tightened up. Like uh, there's textures on this record on songs like uh, The Opposite, which reminded me of Identikit off of a moon shaped pool and it's kind of like the identica is the version of that that's super tightly wound that is really focused into a consistent and coherent structure whereas the opposite is the version of that that just languorously lets you bathe the, in the textures of it if i could say the opposite kind of at point reminds me a bit of like a bit of a like a slightly jammier slightly less in tune version of like some of the improvisations on king crimson's red for a comparison yeah. like it it reminds me of like the songs that are songs but you can definitely tell they're riffing on it obviously this band is not as in tune with each other as king crimson was on that album because they've only been together for a year at this point like they met last literally a year ago at this point together to form this group so it's interesting seeing how they make this record i will say like as i mentioned it being loose it's also interesting because sometimes i listen to tracks on here and there are a few tracks on here that i will say like i feel like if you were to put them on a radiohead record you would listen to it on that album and go this maybe needed another pass through in a way like they feel they feel like they feel less as you said like mold over like and i and sometimes that's a positive. Sometimes it feels fresh. And sometimes I felt like some tracks felt a little like they needed a bit more time on them. But at the same time, that's kind of what you're going to get with a project like this to regain, to keep its energy of just being this free form. It's like they're sort of placing something. It's like they have the ideas from their mind. They're just trying to put them out there. Mm -hmm. And it creates such an interesting vibe on a lot of these tracks like there's so many, like, I, I mean, I think everyone's talking about it, uh, at least from what I can see on regular music, it seems to be the high trade track, and I would agree uh, with that, with We Don't Know What Tomorrow Brings, like, stuff like yeah. Thin Thing, Open the Floodgates, Free and Knowledge, uh, I Still Love You Will Never Work in Television Again. Yes, so do I. Bang. That song goes hard. This album is Body Snatchers. It, it's one of those albums where I would not say like it's not as cohesive as like a, like the best Radiohead albums or anything, but for an album that's supposed to, like if you were to put this in their discography, it wouldn't fare as well. But if you're looking at it as its own thing, its own experience, 
there is so many good tracks on here that I'm going to listen to. There are some that are weaker in my opinion. I'm not big into waving a white flag. I will say that's an extremely farty synth on that track. That is that is a synth that I, I imagine listening to and being like, this is from a straight to DV, straight, straight to VHS fantasy movie from the 80s. Just like the Highlander was a hit. We have to make a rip off of it type thing. <laughs> <laughs> Tom loves those kinds of really sort of detuned synths. And the opposite, I'm not as into the improvisational style as other people are. So that was one of the tracks that wasn't as into me in a lot of ways, because it sometimes felt the least like a full song. Like there was a lot of moments where I was like, well, if they gave this a path, like if they gave this the radio head look, the drumming section at the beginning would have been halved as a sort of intro point, And then things would have moved and th- blow. I get what you're saying. On. I'm glad it's not. Uh, in that case, I think again the the sense of like just lingering in rhythms and sounds and textures. Like I agree actually with a lot of what you're saying, and it kind of touches on some of my limitations with this record as well. But it almost feels like in a career of like albums that are so you know tightly wound like that. It That's feels the like thing. A, it feels yeah. like a real luxury to get a record that is just. I'm not afraid to be kind of like a little bit baggy and a little bit shaggy and kind of just that, let some of those free form ideas just exist between some of the more immediate moments. That's why I say it's both like a blessing and a curse that it's so free because at times you look at it and it's like you kind of feel like the songs kind of don't always have like this flow between them it just kind of feels like you're listening to a playlist in a way but at the same time that's part of the fun of it of just like this doesn't feel like they went through and did many overdubs or anything like that. It just feels like they made it straight in the studio, straight like that. And the interesting part about that is it's a very fun energy. This album also has some of the best, like slow, sort of angry, depressive songs. There's a lot of moments on here that feel like songs off. I mentioned like, I'm a big person who's like, Hail of the Thief, it it should be a big four. Hail of the Thief is the fourth masterpiece. And a lot of these tracks do sound like some of those slower or uh, more electronic tracks on Hail to the Thief in a way. There's a lot of moments of like, like Free and the Knowledge has a lot of that in there. There's this great, the bass riff on Thin Thing is very, feels very much like one of their more electric tracks from uh, the late 90s, early 2000s era, which I'm always a big fan of their electric rock stuff that I really yeah. love. So Thin thing sounds like a live wire that's kind of like spitting electricity at you and you're kind of just trying to dance around it to avoid it. It's so fucking It's going to be kinetic. on the playlist of alternative hipster dance tra- <laughs> like for years. I mean, I like it's going to be, right. they're going to be doing the lotus flower dance to it for, oh <laughs> for <God>. a while. <laughs> um, I like you brought up How to the Thief because I see uh, kinships between this record and that one that go deeper than just some sonic things. I do like, as well. Yeah, there's obviously, I agree that there's maybe no broad, overarching, clear through line concept, but there is this clear themes, I think, on this record. And they oh, come yeah, through. Oh, yeah, definitely. At, and it's, I think, a very political record, sometimes to its detriment, but mostly in a way that just feels like more of what you'd expect from Tom York. This absolutely feels political. like an album that came out of the pandemic in a way. Like it feels like an album of we've been in quarantine for a year, we met up for this, yeah. and we are fucking angry at how. The British media has handled things, which, uh, at, as a trans woman, there's a lot of things to be critical of in the uh, British media. And I will also quickly add, I am glad that Johnny Greenwood admitted that he accidentally liked, <laughs> liked that turf tweet. Yeah, like, so there's a lot of stuff on this record that is a little bit on the nose in a way that Tom has been, like a hair dryer, for instance. It feels a bit like Tom York's Twitter feed, where like I, I always think of that tweet that just has it just says the economy and then like 18 spaces and then it just says stupid. Like yeah. this is <laughs> some of the lyrics I hear feel like that level of commentary. But then again, you have songs like You Will Never Work in Television again that feel genuinely kind of like energetic and pulsing and kind of filled with the venom that I really like to hear. That might be the track that actually could have fit the best on like a Radiohead album too. Like that is something that I could definitely have heard on like on like a Hail to the Thief. Jake already compared it to Body Snatchers, and I think that's a really apt comparison. And speaking yeah, of which, that's, that's great. We compared. have not heard yet from Jake or Morgan in any detail about this record. <laughs> Two huge Radiohead fans. 
why don't you go and i know you guys are pretty both pretty fond of this thing so why don't you talk a little bit about what it is for you and why it holds up and why it's worth uh, considering as a sort of standalone record that deserves your time now i don't necessarily disagree with some of the points that you all have been making i agree with it mostly uh the effect i guess is where i differ um I mean, obviously we did our Radiohead retrospective. We talked about that band an awful lot. We're all big fans. Um, if you know me, you'll know, my favorite album. <laughs> you'll know my favorite album from them is in Rainbows. And one of the reasons my favorite Radiohead album is in Rainbows is because that is the least fussy Radiohead album. It is the most relaxed. It is the most confident. It's the most colorful. It's the one where, despite the fact that that was a very hard album to put together on the band's end, it is an album that oozes effortlessness. It just feels very organic in a way where their previous albums felt like, again, fucking vacuum sealed, airtight kind of shit. And honest to God, The Smile ends up being a sort of culmination and a full realization of a lot of previous Radiohead ideas and albums that I really liked but had limitations with. Uh, no, most notably, I see this album as the meeting point between Amnesiac and Hail to the Thief, both because it has a lot of similar political ideas that Hail to the Thief obviously have, but also the sort of improvisational jazz feeling of something like Amnesiac, and of course, the fact that this does feel like it's sort of going for a Hail to the Thief, almost, you know, throw anything at the wall sonically to just, you know, do it and jam it out, and Honestly, I end up preferring it to those two albums because that effortlessness is what really makes this experience feel so flowing. The, the energy levels here and just the sort of way this kind of ebbs and flows feels a little bit less jagged than those. And that means for me anyway, that this album, which yeah, it's looser, definitely. And that can have its limits with people. But when you are this far into your career and when you are this good at knowing what makes your sound work, I, uh, it's this, this is only my third favorite album we're reviewing this week. And I cannot stress enough how much I love it. Um, I, and I was kind of apprehensive because I didn't really look into the singles that much. And I, Same. I kind of like Tom York's side projects like Anima and stuff, but like they always ring to me as a little bit more skeletal like something is always missing from them that i just feel like needs a certain spice or, or, or x factor or fullness to kind of really propel it into being something i can fully get behind and this finally feels like they have arrived at the side project that most aligns with why i love their music you know and not to keep comparing it to their stuff but again it's that venn diagram thing this is just it has the same appeal as albums like that and it doesn't have the things that like you know, one of my limitations with Hail to the Thief was that that album is like, even on songs that I like, they still don't necessarily feel of at peace with each other. Whereas here, everything is so loose that it kind of feels like everything is just sort of, there, there are no limitations. Like, you know, the same in the opposite, starting off with two tracks named that and tracks that are diametrically opposed in terms of sound and atmosphere. You have the same, which is like, really more of the ethereal atmospheric side and then the opposite, which is a little bit more direct and a little bit more hard hitting. And that sort of dichotomy is presented for you out front. And then the band elaborates on that dichotomy a little bit. And naturally, I also think the songwriting is really fucking good. It's simple, but it's really, really effective. And I find it a little bit more evocative than previous Radiohead political messages. I mean, take for what is easily going to be one of my favorite songs from any of these guys, who, like just across all projects, which is uh, Speech Bubbles, an immensely underrated song, if you ask me. Um, this song is like, it really carries a sort of emotionality that I really love about this album, that it is kind of a political record, but it's also the political album that Radiohead are the least dour about. Like A Moon Shaped Pool is also a really political, very topical album, but it's like inflicted with, with death and doom and, and even stuff like Amnesiac, I feel like you could argue is the same thing. And Hail to the Thief obviously does not have a very good, you know, opinion on the current state of things. Whereas here, this is very much focusing on the revolutionary aspect of everything. And it's a bit more optimistic than those. Like Speech Bubbles is honestly like, I love the first 
five songs on here. I think they're great, but Speech Bubbles is where the album really, really finds its stride for me. I think that even though this is a lyrically brisk song, it's one of the most emotional things to hear. The lilting guitar and strings are just fucking gorgeous. And Tom sings about the plight of a child fleeing a burning city, perhaps like in the aftermath of revolution, that the first leg of the album has really like been describing and building up. I don't quite think it's a narrative concept album, but I do think that there is kind of a through line here that can be followed very, very clearly. Uh, and the really, the depth here is in the details in that it's like, he's describing what it's like to not have a home to return to faced by a, a world of uncertainty. The bridge posits three possible fates looming on the horizon for the main character. You can find a temporary place to exist. You can find a cab in the rain or a vein to put a needle in, which I can only guess is turning to drugs. The possible hint of an authoritative voice that sounds like bells ringing is alluded to in this song. And I love love the instrumental swell that happens right here as he mentions it. Musically, it, it just embodies the sound of the hopeful voice that the child in the song hears. It's subtle, but it's really, really effective. And honestly, I really think they just knock it out of the park on every single song from here. Uh, I love the way just how odd Thin Thing sounds. The guitar tones are so fucking weird. The rhythm is so odd. Uh, I love the psychedelic synth swell a minute and 20 seconds in that kind of reprises the opposite's rhythmic guitar line, but like faster in tempo. And it's really like, it just kind of blossoms and it's really dynamic. It's really bubbly bright synths on this. Um, and then it goes into Open the Floodgates, which is my favorite song on here. This is just like, it's lyrically brisk, but it's instrumentally so rich. I love the woozy synths. I love the pianos that just kind of swirl around the mix here. The song itself is actually kind of an emblem for this project as a whole. It seems to be about the artistic desire to stick to your inspiration despite a demanding audience and public that has certain expectations of you, specifically when it comes to emotions, as the lyrics seem to snidely imply that heartache is just sappy bullshit that music made without a struggle that's safe and lacks any evocative qualities is how you please your audience. Whereas the chorus is like Tom trying to steer himself in the right direction, stay true to himself, which makes this feel like a sort of mission statement. And it sort of poses that like, it opposes the idea of like common apolitical indifference, so many people who want politics to be kept out of music. In many ways, this is the album's My Iron Lung or just, you know, Radiohead have been ruminating on the fact that they've been called sappy and over-emotional for years now. And I think this is maybe the most well-realized rebuttal of that. Uh, and I, I respect it. Uh, it's, I think freeing the knowledge afterwards is also just goddamn amazing. Uh, absolutely stunner. It actually reminds me a lot of like Stephen Wilson's kind of slower and more methodical musical detours on his solo work. Yeah. It, it, despite the song like alluding to something pretentious in a song like Free in the Knowledge, it's a song that's like about perseverance and finding solace in the idea that change, even the, though it comes at the cost of death, is kind of a liberation. It's sad, but it's not self-defeating, which is kind of tough. The, the insistence of Tom's like, we won't get caught, feels really earnest. I think the hairdryer is honestly a really underrated song on the album. I think that the it's it's very strange lyrically, but the two predatory animals in the song, I think are kind of supposed to represent politicians or those in power, painting them as constantly elusive, distracted by pretty lights. The outro is they temporar temporarily avoid people that call them out to be consumed by predators. And yeah, waving a white flag is weird. Uh, it's odd. It's kind of proggy synths. It's, it's a, just a strange arrangement, but I kind of respect it. Um, I love We Don't Know What Tomorrow Brings, as, I mean, Emily already pointed out, that's a big highlight on the record. Jake, um, can I just these... say real quick that, uh, that this song, and it reminded me of a very specific song, I don't even know if you remember this song, because it's been a while since we've talked hmm. about this band, but We Don't Know What Tomorrow Brings specifically reminded me of the song uh, Every Night My Teeth Are Falling Out by The Antlers from their first oh, album it has the exact oh, same and, energy as this as that song and i was like that's a deep cut that i <laughs> thank god i uh, thank god i really love that album i completely see that actually and that explains why i actually really like it yeah um this really like kind of just really goes to town with those blaring synths. It's, it's a really cathartic sounding song. I just love the energy and skirting on the surface is just, it kind of cleverly reprises most of the themes on the album, like speech bubbles, for example, where it talks about the fragility of life is painted as this paper thin barrier that should incentivize people to push forward. You know, being on the verge of change, all we have to do is take the plunge. It's gorgeous, it's layered, it's jazzy. It's one of the most dense arrangements on here. 
it's this is not an album that has that sort of radiohead tightness that you're used to but as someone like me who appreciates the detours that this band takes into being something a bit more exploratory i find this wholly satisfying there's not a moment on here where i'm not in total lockstep with what the band is doing atmospherically it's a really rich sounding album i think that nigel godrich like sucked all of the energy out of the Arcade Fire album he produced and then injected extra juice into this one to make it sound even better. And like Palpatine overall, style. I mean, <laughs> basically just like, ah. And then, <laughs> look, if we had to come at the sacrifice of one to get the benefit of the other, then I am going to, look, there was no saving that other album anyway, so good job dividing the energy. But regardless, I find this to be a really satisfying experience in a way that no Radiohead album has quite been, even though I compared it to Hail to the Thief and In Rainbows and Amnesiac. It doesn't have the kind of aimlessness of Amnesiac that frustrates me, and it doesn't have the kind of inconsistency sonically that Hail to the Thief has in that it kind of sometimes sounds like one thing and kind of sometimes sounds like another, whereas this feels more free-flowing. It's a, it's a project that is very much defined by the fact that it has no limitations, and I just... That's the that's the juice. I like it. It's cute. good. It sounds good. Morgan, what do you think? It, in truth, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it, and that it is is a very interesting aside to Radiohead. It almost plays like one of their B sides albums to an album that didn't exist. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love that. I, I don't I totally get that. I feel that too. Yeah. Which is not at all a knock on the album because I think within that sort of idea, it's very well structured and cohesive. And I enjoyed nearly all of it. The only thing, there are only a couple things that didn't really strike me on it. And pretty much everything else is up to snuff for an uh, album that has Tom York and Johnny Greenwood on it. The real standout for me, and it has been mentioned here, but uh, my absolute favorite on this album is the closing track, Skirting on the Surface. Like for me, I think, Jake, Jake, what you said about how it kind of brings the album together. And that's kind of funny because like, this is an album, this is a song that's been around for 13 years that Radiohead have played yep. at live shows and stuff. And it's kind of just like how Dawn Chorus, which used to be a Radiohead song, found a life on Anima, right? I, I see this as kind of like a similar example of a song that kind of percolates and grows uh, for a really long time and then eventually just finds its place when it's ready. And this to me is, is perfect and ready. And what I love about it is, yeah, it, it's beautifully solemn and serene and gorgeous, but it has this sort of uplifting sense of hope to it. And it's really accentuated by the horns that come in through on the song, which are actually yeah. also, I believe, God. played by members of Sons of Kemet. So you have this really it's gorgeous so resolution where it kind of fills out musically in a way that you're not expecting. Uh, yeah. I will say the moments on this album where the piano sort of takes center stage, the piano playing of Tom York is always just somehow this man can put his hands on a piano, play like the simplest melodies, and it feels like the most gorgeous thing anyone's ever done on with that instrument uh open the floodgates a great example of that. Uh, but i also want to shout out panavision which is a song i love as well that hasn't yeah. been mentioned yet gorgeous piano melodies here gorgeous lyrical motifs and melodies here love it love it love it love it love it um free in the knowledge obviously a big standout for reasons that have been well articulated oh, very much reminded me of uh, the, the numbers off of the moon shape pool to a certain extent um oh, i just, definitely hear that and the feel of it and yeah, the only things that I, I want to give Speech Bubbles another chance because I was reading through the lyrics, Jade, while you were speaking about it quite eloquently. And it is a very beautiful song lyrically. It just musically hasn't quite connected for me yet, but it may still. Uh, the real, the only real uh, down point I would say is the smoke, which is like a, a great bass line in search of a song is what I will call that. Hey, I really like the smoke. It, I do too. It, it's, it, nice. it's the lesser song on the album, but I do really like it a lot. It's nice, and I get it. And I and there's nothing on this record that remotely approaches even middling to me. There's just things I like yeah. more than other things. And smoke um, is honestly like a mirror image of Burn the Witch. I think, like lyrically, Ooh. if you kind of look into it, it's like 
it's it's built around that like baseline and everything so it kind of has like an interesting opposition to it but like this is a song like burn the witch is a song where paranoia and mob mentality consumes people right yeah. and they do something unspeakable but here is like the titular smoke comes from the fires of protesters setting themselves on fire the smell of which wakes you up and encourages you to like join in this kind of act of revolution which yeah. in and of itself is painted in a really positive light which again i can't stress this enough Radiohead's made political music. They have almost never made hopeful political music. This, on the other hand, feels, it's distinctly injected with a kind of life that I just really appreciate right now. Yeah, that, that image really of like, self-immolation, like that feels like a particularly dark image even for Tom. Like it feels like there's a lot. Mm. One of the things I will say with regard to the Proteus music angle, because Tom has made a lot of songs that could be construed in that way or as a kind of overt political messaging. It feels as though that's getting as you would expect, more and more urgent, more and more kind of ugly and sort of more and more violent mm -hmm. uh, from Tom as he gets older, which I really appreciate. I think uh, you could even read the album title as kind of a reference to that image in this song of someone who's kind of mm -hmm. set themselves on fire as a way to kind of, you know, bring awareness to mm -hmm. the ugliness of the situation that, that we're in. And I mean, even the songs that are more sprightly and upbeat on this record, We Don't Know What Tomorrow Brings, etc., can really, I think, be read through the, the knowledge through that very mm. dark and kind of urgent lens and so yeah the record gets big props for that aspect all right let's move into our favorite tracks and ratings for the smiles uh a light that never goes out something like that um <laughs> uh, jake why don't you go first uh all right my three favorite tracks on a light for attracting attention are going to be speech bubbles uh as i mentioned Open the floodgates and free the knowledge. Uh, least favorite is probably waving a white flag, but that's again one of the grower moments on here. And uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm just a fucking weirdo, but like if you followed our Radiohead rankings and are just curious, if I put this alongside the Radiohead albums, this would land basically in the dead center of my ranking right after um, it would be in Rainbow's OK Computer, uh, a moon shaped cool kid A, and then this. I, I just yeah, Damn. sorry. Shots. Uh, I give it a nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. All right, sick. Uh, all this hasn't listened. Morgan, your rating and favorite tracks. Uh, three favorites: "Free in the Knowledge," "The Same," and "Skirting on the Surface." Uh, least favorite: I will probably say "A Hair Dryer." Uh, just one of the couple of songs that didn't really strike me, uh, but you know, it's it's decent. Uh, and I will give this an eight and a half out of 10. All right. My three favorite tracks are going to be, yeah, Skirting on the Surface. Uh, and I will say mm, Open the Floodgates. And I'll actually put uh, You Will Never Work in Television Again is my third favorite. Uh, least favorite is The Smoke. And the album gets a hearty 7.5 from me. My favorite tracks on this album, uh, We Don't Know What Tomorrow Brings, uh, Open the Floodgates, uh, and Thin Thing, though I really, if we had, were, if I was able to put a fourth one, it would be You Will Never Work in Television Again, because that, that is also a great track. And uh, my least favorite, I, I'm going to go with Speech Bubbles. It just is a track that I don't find much objectionable about it, but I find it very dozy for me i just don't find myself getting much into its vibe if that makes sense uh and i'm going to give it an eight out of ten i i would say that this is a really solid record you have to kind of approach it with the idea of like if you keep putting it in the shadow of this band that has literally changed music like for <laughs> your it's of course it's going to to have some difficulty like communicating itself but if you approach it as this sort of you know, King Crimson's Red jam session thing, it becomes so refreshing in how it's delivered. And while it's not like, I wouldn't say it's my favorite record of the year, it's deservedly getting so much praise because it it is a great, great record. Again, an eight is a great score from me. And that's always how I like to say it. It's a great album. All right, so that gives us an average rating of 8.3 for The Smiles, A Light, for attracting attention. Let's move on to our last review of the day, the big one. Kendrick Lamar, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, 
Now, you all know who Kendrick Lamar is. You watched our Kendrick Lamar discography breakdown video. If you didn't, it's in the link below. Please go and listen to it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Do it. First up, I want to throw over to Jake because he was my partner in that video and I'm sure we'll have very interesting thoughts on this record. Jake, what is Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers to you and how does it hold up? I will save the more in-depth discussion for my partners here who are a bit more uh, well-equipped to do that, but to set the stage a little bit. Yes, this is Kendrick's first album in five years since Damn, uh, and now it's out. The rollout for it was incredibly mysterious. We didn't even get a technical single from it. Uh, it just kind of dropped after he did the heart pipe part five. And uh, now we're here Track with didn't even leak. Nope. They're here with Kendrick's double album, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. And this album is a fucking beast. It's an album that kind of like Damn, when it initially came out, it was met with the initial praise that an artist, artist as big as Kendrick with a following as big as Kendrick is going to get a big, you know, positive response from, but it's also kind of like Damn in the respect that consensus on it still feels like it's a billion miles away. Um, the degree to which people are into this, I have seen opinions all over the internet about. I have seen some people say that this ranks among his best. I have seen that some people say that this is his weakest effort. I have seen everything. Um, and naturally that made it very difficult for me to form my own opinion just because there's a lot of baggage with Kendrick as an artist. And in general, it's just kind of difficult to evaluate someone who holds such an important, such a big place in culture right now. But to abandon all of that, even though I think the biggest sort of attribute of Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers is that it does not abandon its cultural importance because that is kind of more or less what the album is about when it comes to Kendrick standing in the world in, as an artist, as a human being, what people think of him, what people think of himself. He's always been a self-conscious guy and this is a very self-conscious self post-damn, post-T-Pab, post I'm going through these big, long, personal struggle albums, and now I am cementing as to where I am right now. And the result is a confident display of really, really solid musicianship from front to back. And overall, in its blindingly big scope in terms of what it's going for, I think that it is largely very, very excellent. And it also really, really, really loses me in the back half. The front half of this album, I think, is amazingly compelling, amazingly consistent. I think it has some of his best and most immediate songs and veers into a direction that Kendrick has not fully explored up until this point. I think it starts off with a great run of songs with United in Grief, N95, and Worldwide Steppers, all really, really solid. The big points for me are the, for some reason, everybody's not as into Die Hard as I am. I love this song. I think that Father Time is maybe one of Kendrick's most thoughtful tracks. Um, the rich spirit, I think, is fun and upbeat. We Cry Together is an interesting moment on the album that I think is probably going to spark more discussion that I won't be around here for, but I will say it definitely does hurt the pacing upon repeated listens because it's a long fucking protracted out st uh, skit ish type thing. But Kendrick and uh, fucking uh, Taylor Page are remarkably well committed to this skit and they are acting their asses off. Um, I also think that Purple Hearts and Count Me Out are good. And then after that, I do think the album loses its way a little bit with really, really repetitive and really, really sonically uninteresting songs like Crown and Silent Hill and Savior. And as much discussion has been done about songs like Auntie Diaries, I understand what Kendrick is doing here and what's uh, like the overall sort of understanding of wanting to show his progression on this particular um, aspect of his life with his trans uncle. I think the song is well-intentioned. I'm glad he made it. I do not think it is entirely successful because he has to make too many artistic concessions in order to arrive at his point, but I nonetheless think it's a compelling moment in a sea of uh, not more compelling moments on the back here. Mr. Morale is kind of an underwhelming song for me. Mother I Sober and Mira really pick things up as I think Mira might be the best song on here. So my thoughts are all over the place. This album is all over the place. I'm sure your thoughts are all over the place. I think that this is a very, very confident release. It's not half-baked. It's not, you know, uh, th there are some things that Kendrick does on here that I do think are a little bit kind of self-critical to the point of maybe a, a bit uh, kind of futile just because it feels like he's explored this aspect of his psyche and this aspect of his savior complex and where it's gotten him, it's a little bit too mind. Like, I get it. We've been exploring this since To Pimp a Butterfly. We elaborated it further and kind of showed a reflection on it on Dan. And it feels like Kendrick is 
presenting lots of new ideas, pushing himself forward, but hasn't really pulled himself out of the past yet. And it results in an album that, while I do think is pretty good, ends up being a bit of a mixed bag for the enormity of it that it is. Uh, I give the album a seven out of 10. My favorite songs are Mirror, Father of Time, Die Hard. Least favorite song is Silent Hill. Bye. Morgan, I know you've got to go soon as well. So I want to throw yeah. it over to you next and I want to hear what you think about this. Yeah, so I'm going to get real big brain here for a moment. And it is, I had the realization partially because we recorded an episode on this very album before this session. Uh, but this is Kendrick Lamar's Vitalogy, I think, the Pearl Jam album Vitalogy. Uh, <laughs> it is a deliberate uh, wrong footing and rejection of the massive amount of acclaim and hype and idol worship and expectation that has been thrust upon him in the wake of albums like Good Kid, Mad City to Pimp a Butterfly and Damn. And it is basically as sprawling as that record, uh, if not even more so. Um, it's indulgent and it misses occasionally. There are moments on here that I'm just not really all that fond of, but it always sounds great for one thing particularly opener and closer united in grief and mirror respectively which are my two highlights of the record and there are also some additional uh, highlights like mother i sober uh i thought we cry together was really strong and uh great yeah i agree sort of ha uh, really just i didn't find it all that musically compelling but just as a sort of spoken word piece almost it like really felt like channeling arguments in Cassavetti's movies or something <laughs> and just really going for that and mostly it succeeded moments like anti-diaries which are similarly sort of less music emphasis emph the music is less emphasized and it's more a sort of uh, opportunity for uh, spoken word segments almost kind of like therapy um, sessions is how I think of them yeah anti Dyers is a bit less successful for me than we cry together uh, just because I don't think it's as well written or performed as the former and their placements on the respective sides of the album are relatively close and sort of parallel each other so there's there's part of it that I feel like sort of invites itself to comparison in that sense but yeah, the, there are definite highlights on here. Father Time, as mentioned, already way up there. Uh, I also really enjoyed Die Hard and Worldwide Steppers and N95. Uh, really, basically, the entire front half is just uh, front to back stuff I love. There are moments where the album is, is intent on rejecting an audience. And I, much like Vitalogy, even though I don't like this album nearly as much as that, I really respect the position that Kendrick is coming from. And I almost would have taken this over another huge crowd pleaser if yeah. it meant that this is just what Kendrick wants to do, regardless of how anybody feels about it. If he wanted to make another album that was going to get a 4.23 or whatever on rate music, I would have been happy to see that, but only if that's what he was interested in. Hmm. Um, and Great. this is, no matter what comes next, this feels essential for Kendrick's discography. And I will be looking forward to whatever comes next. Three favorites uh, we do. Uh, yeah, Mirror, United in Grief, and Father Time. Least favorite, uh, probably Savior, which is I, think is, I think is fine. It just doesn't really, it ain't, it ain't hit. Damn. It'll say, that's an album. Yeah, that was the joke. <laughs> and I will give this an eight out of ten overall. Hell yes. <clears throat> All right. All right. Peace out, man. Okay, so there's a few things to pick up on there. Uh, I know you'll be full of thoughts. There's a couple of things I just want to establish, and then I'll kind of let you um I'll let you kind of dig into the rich tapestry. So what's kind of been alluded to, something that we've both already kind of mentioned is the whole conceit and structure of the album as a therapy session. 
And again, more, Kendrick has never made a not concept album. <laughs> he can't help himself. I think if he wanted to, he couldn't avoid making a concept record. Again, comparing to Radiohead, it's like it's like they're just sitting there like, God, everything has to be a concept album with yeah. or a new sonic direction. <laughs> like, yeah, hundred percent. Same thing here. I, I'm. This is certainly an album. We talk. So they brought up the instrumentals as well. Like. It's it's a, no Kendrick album I will say has sounded bad instrumentally, mm. and this is also certainly one that uh, I wouldn't say sounds. It sounds like a movie like, box. Yeah, it, I would also say it doesn't even sound like much either. Like it's a, it's so interesting the way it brings stuff together. Like mm. there's this sort of it's not jazzy like to Pim Butterfly, but it's jazz in its ideas of just pulling everything in like they listen to united in grief and you're like is that a bongo like well you're just like listening and you're like what are like if, it's one of those tracks where if you just if like all of a sudden a violin started playing off key you'd be like yeah no that like, fits when the, <laughs> when the fucking like drum and bass beat comes in like here's the thing right so this kind of ties into the whole sort of conceit of the album what kendrick's trying to do is like one of the, th the things I most appreciate about this album, and it's something that's been remarked upon, but I feel like I can't be impressed enough, is like how kind of crazy it is and how cool it is that essentially the biggest artist in the world, maybe not commercially, but certainly in terms of like artists, like music as an art form, like the most well-regarded and highly regarded and, and generally beloved, is making an album that is kind of deliberately about kind of saying fuck you a little bit to the expectations and also the kind of responsibilities kind of thrusted upon a person of that stature, the extent to which their personhood is kind of robbed by the designation of like goat or the designation of like voice of a generation or the designation of like all of these different but things. I think it's interesting that he acknowledges that he also put that voice on himself. Like That's in true. Butterfly, it's him basically saying like, I have to be the next Tupac. I have to be yeah. this person to lead this generation. And that's what's so beautiful about Tupac Butterfly is it's him going through a similar process like this and coming out so hopeful about like, maybe yeah. I can help lead this. And this is him, the realistic sort of conclusion of just sort of being like, no, I can't do this alone. I'm not going to be able to be perfect. No, and, and exactly. And, and like a, a lot of it is him coming to terms with the fact five year gap since, and you can tell that like some of the lyrics here were definitely written fairly recently. Uh, maybe not all oh, of yeah. them, but some of them. And so a lot of it is, you know, he's reflecting on this passage of time. And part of the reason why that passage of time existed is the fact that Kendrick sort of had, had was going through a lot of shit. I've been going through something, as he says at the start of the record, right? Yeah. He's he's had to come to terms with a lot of his faults, a lot of things that he's done that he's not proud of. And he's also had to come to a certain personal realization about, you know, his actual limitations. And the Kendrick of this album, as you say, light years away from the Kendrick of To Pimp a Butterfly because this is Kendrick who is fallible in a way that is not, you know, for the sake of like depicting this this kind of like Masonic, messianic figure who has to reckon with the, the, the roles of being a messianic figure, but it's actually like being a messianic figure who suddenly has to reckon with the fact that he's actually human and like he's not essentially all of these things that, you know, he, he's kind of grown up a little bit because it's worth remembering all of his other albums were released before he turned 30. And so he yeah. has grown up a little bit now and he's kind of had to come to the realization that he can't be what he's been told he has to be, what he maybe wanted to be. He has to be a human being. He has to be responsible. He has to kind of acknowledge and deal with the shit that's gone in his own way in his life. And it would be foolish and pointless of him to try and make music that, it's, that attempts to skirt around that or that attempts to do anything other than directly confront it head on. And this is where you get to one of the most interesting aspects of the record, one of the most controversial aspects of the record, which is the ways in which Kendrick reckons with uh, how we come to understand and categorize Black artists, how we come to understand and uh, reconcile when people who are harmful and people who do harmful things come from harm and how we come to sort of understand and reconcile the 
harmful things that people do with the harm that they experience. And this, I think, is a big part of the inclusion of Kodak Black on this album. A very controversial Even if it does decision. make me feel a little, yeah. And, this and is one of those things makes that makes me feel, feel a little uncomfortable, sick. right? It makes you feel yeah. uncomfortable as well. And that's undeniably exactly what it's intended to do. I don't think Kendrick is putting Kodak on here just because he likes Kodak as a rapper or whatever. There's, I, Kendrick is smart. We have to give him that. And I think he absolutely understands the effect because it's not just that Kodak is controversial for the horrible things that he's done, but he's also just not generally well liked as a performer no. all that much. He doesn't have a lot I of will, credibility. I will also say, as much as I'm going to be a little bit critical of the conclusion of Kodak, because again, rape is a very serious thing to forgive. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. I don't know that Kendrick is necessarily saying you have to forgive Kodak. I think the point oh, yeah. is that you... And Kendrick is, again, he's doing this in the most blunt and kind of uh, in-your-face way possible because he's putting someone right in front of you who is kind of, for a lot of people, going to be unforgivable. And it comes back to Mortal Man when he was like, when the shit hits the fan, will you still be a fan? Like, what are you... When Which is you also support? probably one of his tracks that has aged the worst for the fucking Michael Jackson thing. Well, maybe, but the point <laughs> is still the same, I think, and it still has a yeah. lot of relevance where it's like, regardless, forget about the specific things that these artists have yeah. done and just focus on... But then again, he touched on R. Kelly with... Uh, For with, sure, we, yes. We, uh, he yeah. does. He mentions R. Kelly. Well, actually, um, Taylor Page mentions R. Kelly on We Cry Together. And then he yeah, and then Kendrick Kelly responds later. with, but you still listen to his music. Which is a valid point about the hypocrisy of some forms of uh, the ways in which these conversations happen. But anyway, my point is... Kendrick is deliberately making the most inflammatory possible decision, putting Kodak Black in prime position on this album because he is, and this is a, not a new theme for him, he wants to get to the bottom of how exactly Black artists are considered and thought about and how exactly we reconcile and to a certain extent dehumanize people who do ugly and unforgivable and abusive things. And it's not to say that we should ha we have to forgive them. And it's right. not to say that their behavior is to be excused, but it's an interesting exercise from Kendrick's perspective on how people, particularly black people, are pe treated in a particular light, are dehumanized in a particular light uh, when they do these awful, horrible things. And it is Kendrick kind of interrogating his audience and saying, how, to what extent do you view these people as human? To what extent do you view these people as artists? And to what extent do you, do, do the things that they do get in the way of it for you and it's not Kendrick saying that it shouldn't get in the way of it for you or anything he wants you to just think about it he wants you to dwell in that space he wants you to think about the relationship between art and the artist and I bring this up because it's a thing that feels like it dominates cultural discourse online so much and it's so saturated sure. and it's so easy to get fatigued of it because we're so tired of one artist after another being revealed to have done something awful and just it makes us especially question. as a queer woman like it's exactly. like i get so many side shots from that stuff exactly. I, I get hurt fear from awful. sex from sexual misogyny and i get hurt from queer phobia and i get stuck in the crosshairs of like mm. i obviously i don't get the worst of it that would probably be you know yep. a black trans woman with more stuff than me but you know what i mean like there's still like an element of like, fuck, like, as I mentioned, Johnny Greenwood earlier, like that would have that for the first hour before he admitted, like, yeah, I, I, I have fat fingers. I apologize. Like that was me being like, this person's like a hero to me. I can't withhold, like, I can't never go to a concert again. Like it was hard enough for me to say, I, I'm never going to go see swans because I don't want to give Michael Jira money. To say that about the band that is literally an inspiration to a lot of my decisions to just sort of be more creatively mm -hmm. fluid and let myself experiment more, that was a heartbreaking idea to me. It's, it's the same way I have to discuss art in general. Like mm -hmm. if I say last, last, I don't know if it was last night or the night before that I was listening to Brand New and I had to end my tweet with, by the way, fuck Jesse Lacey. And mm -hmm. I also, and I have to do the same thing when I'm talking about like Dancer in the Dark with Lars von Trier or Manhattan by Woody Allen mm -hmm. or pretty much anything by Bertolucci because holy shit, what the fuck, man? Why did you do that? The thing that's fucked up about all of this, right, is that you have, you, well, people like you and, and me sometimes, but we feel we have to say these things. and Because people stupid. might think that the, but, but the, the choice is like, not. Do you think I'm pro-rape? Like if I don't say yeah, right. this person, like, do you think that therefore there's an assumption of sympathy? Like 
that's one of the things that I dislike the most about artistic discourse surrounding really problematic and harmful people is that there's almost an assumption of the worst intent on the part of just people who engage with art, like random people on the internet. There's this assumption of nefarious intent. And just to draw things back to Kendrick a little bit here, I think that one of the things he's kind of, uh, he's kind of examining and maybe being a bit provocative with it, potentially lacking maybe some nuance, maybe being deliberately a bit hard edged about it, is he is, and again, goes back to Mortal Man, he's always wanting the listener to think about how do they engage with art? How do they engage with artists? How do they choose who to platform essentially? And how do they choose who to de-platform? And again, contentious topic, lots of opinions, one of the things oh, yeah. I love about Kendrick is that he lets you make your own mind up and he just wants you to think it, about it. Uh, it's and- very much, because one of the things that I think makes him very special as an artist is he is analyzing himself at the same time as analyzing society and asking you to analyze yourself. Mm-hmm. It feels like a very even transfer of things mm-hmm. where a lot of artists can feel sort of like they're speaking down to you or sometimes like, that can be the issue with a lot of, say, Nas's work, post Illmatic or stuff like that, where he has gotten this like, idea that he has to speak for you. Mm-hmm. Kendrick has always had this idea of like, if if it is not an equal exchange between us, then it is not going to be a fair record for us. And it's yeah. the same way with this album. This reflects a lot of the themes of like something that was on Damn, whereas the idea of I have this anger in me that I could have gone down this even worse path than the path I already went down and I discussed in Good Kid, Mad City what does that mean about me? And this is him sort of dealing with those conclusions. He probably deal, dealt with it. And I guess to talk about Kodak Black, not just outside of his allegations and stuff, but just talking about him musically on here, this is certainly the best verses I've heard from Kodak Black ever. Yeah. This is, there's certainly no lines in here that uh, evoke the same feeling as uh, I go stupid on a bitch like I'm autistic or... <laughs> That's a real line. Or Honestly, I like my, I, I like my, like, if I forget I like that my pussy's bald that, like Caillou. I forget that it's him saying those things kind of hard, to be honest. <laughs> those bars are kind of, are kind of fucking hard. Um, What's but, the fucking, I'm in that pussy feels like mac and cheese, which like, that's not okay, the that's mac not and cheese hard. comparison. That's terrible. That's awful. <laughs> no. But yeah, you're right. Like, I actually quite enjoy the performances of Kodak when he shows up. It like, weirdly feels like since he's been to prison and like had this huge break and had his sort of career falter a lot more like he's gotten weirdly a lot more introspective about yeah. himself than he ever has and oh. it's very interesting that I think Kendrick brought that out of him because it's him basically saying like you know people don't think I should be here well I can prove to them that like I've learned from stuff and that's very interesting for the theme of the record yeah well here's the thing Even right? because if... he brings Kodak on and on the savior he sees like he sees himself in Kodak to a certain extent which tells yeah. you something interesting right like, he's challenging you to think like I am here kind of being open about the worst things that I've done and those are maybe not within our culture or just objectively speaking that terrible they're just kind of like personal moral failures whereas here's someone who's done some things that are on some level like moral categorical you know terrible things yeah and he's equating himself with that and kind of asking you again to think about where the line is and what it would take for you to forgive because Ken- Kendrick is asking the listener what does it take you for, for you to forgive me he's asking his wife or partner to a certain extent what would it what it, would it take for you to forgive me and she's essentially responding with like actually go to therapy open yourself up you know, talk to Eckhart Tolle, which is just a hilarious uh, recurring reference point, obviously a real inspiration for Kendrick. And so he's kind of getting you to think about these sorts of things about what forgiveness even is, what it takes for you to, what can be forgived, what does forgiveness mean? Does, and does forgiveness mean you have to like someone? Does forgiveness mean you have to, cons- you can continue consuming their art, but you don't have to like them? Like all these different dimensions to what it means to reckon with the, re- the reality of who this artist you love just is as a person. And again, that's like the co- core theme right at the heart of this record is like artists versus people. Artists are people. And that I mean, the yeah. theme of the heart part, uh, is it five? Five, the yeah. Heart part five? Yeah, the, the idea of like, I am all of us and the fact that I am imperfect and like mm-hmm. the idea of like, there's this very, if you look at like the way he structured his sort of, the way he talks about himself on each album, like, you know, 
Mad City, Kid, Good Kid, Mad City. He's the angel on. He's the angel on. Made me an angel on Angel Dust. There's the. Uh, you go on to Firefly. It's the King Kunta. It's the guy who's supposed to be leading this new age of black culture and trying to find out what that means in a culture that's been so rocked over so much time and learning how to deal with it. And then you go to damn it, it's Kung Fu Kenny. It's this abrasive hit. It's this idea of like who he could have been. And who a lot of people at rap want him to be like this idea of like this brace of take no shit from no one idea and how it kind of terrifies the idea of him that he could possibly be that. And then you get to this album, Oklahoma, family. He wants to sort of like Oklahoma he wants to accept himself. Family and family means family. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> he's actually Stitch on this album. It's a, it's a concert album where he's Stitch. It um, sounds a bit like Stitch on Silent Hill. Uh, I, I, while we're talking about sounds like I should make the obvious joke I always make, which is Baby Keem just sounds like Kendrick putting on a voice forever. You know what? <laughs> we talked about Baby Keem. I think maybe it was the last time that you were on when he when yeah. the blue had come out. And it was really funny because like he, he was kind of like a gimmicky, jokey, kind of like a little bit annoying. But now that I don't know what it is, maybe it's just what he's surrounded by here. But I really enjoy it. He, he's really introspective here. He's His vocals are gorgeous. Like the way he sings. And especially... Um, with the contrast of uh, Mother I Sober now, like with the line of, I hope, I hope Hakeem's making you proud, where you're like, holy shit, like, like, you, you don't even think about that, like, he has family that has passed away that he's trying to do proud in this sense, and Kendrick comparing his success to his and being like, I'm trying to keep him from repeating my mistakes of like spending too much money and using it as a, as a, as a thing, as like something to replace the heart, it really contextualized things where like, before it was like the idea of like, oh, Baby Keem's the more like harsh of the streets version of Kendrick or something like that. And now it's like, no, they're from the same, like they're cut from the same cloth. The difference is, is that Baby Keem's still trying to find himself while Kendrick had like five years of like um, being under top dog of like learning who to find himself. And that's when we found him. And it's this I idea did my of like, time, him being- Five years of it in Azkaban. <laughs> I did my five years of it. I did an entire Little Wayne EP. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made, what was that track that uh, that he made that everyone makes fun of like when he was really young? Oh, I have he, to think he's of, got so many of them from his like mixed I, days. All I can think of is the old, the, I, I don't know what song it's from, but the, the image I always like posting online where it's just the lyrics of him going, a shit fart pee pee. <laughs> I believe that's on his as a uh, little Wayne where he just does stuff from the Cardi, but uh, uh, was it? There's so much interesting stuff on here because it, as I said, like it reminds me of Dam in the sense of except Dam was interpolating this idea of like guilt followed by like an action and then the guilt behind it, the action and then the guilt behind it. This divides it into walking around the issue to having to confront them specifically. Which I will say one of the weird things about that is I'm not sure why Die Hard is on the first half instead of the second half. Because it's literally him saying, like, I feel better now that I've addressed, like, I can still love myself now that I know that I've made mistakes. And I'm like, well, we haven't gotten to that point in the album yet. I'm surprised he puts it so early. Yeah, (laughs) N95 is, I I like where it is on the album, but it's very funny intro to the album because you have this really, like, explosive, like, a scream of grief and then immediately oh you ugly <laughs> like, it's a very but it, it fits the themes of like i will all like i'm just like you know he's using masks as this like you know n95 masks as like a theme of like the fakeness that we use to cover up our souls which by the way to the person on twitter who said that he was anti-mask uh, you're an idiot uh and also get, that doesn't make him based um, basic <laughs> reading comprehension <laughs> Yeah, but like, uh, it's so it, it's such an interesting comparison to then like follow that up with like worldwide steppers, which God the instru- that's my favorite instrumental it's on the so entire fucking, record. It's so just, creative, it gets under your just, skin. Just that, dun, 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 like that's something that you're going to be seeing in like compilation. Like that's going to be like an intro, like instrumental for like, like. I don't know the Lakers or something like that in like years from now because it's just such a driving like fuck like building yourself up and then the way it sort of breaks up in the middle and becomes like this very soulful moment it's like 
and then immediately it cuts back to it. It has this, I like this feeling of just like this overtaking of you, like this, and you know, the feeling of I'm a killer, she's a killer, you're a killer too. Like the idea of like, basically like, as he compares, like he's like, yes, I, I regret the stuff I did for getting involved with gangbangers and stuff like that. But there's so many corporations that are trying to like sign me to their bill that are doing the shit slower than me and they yeah. can't act like they have that moral superiority over me. Yeah. The beat on very... this song kind of sounds like it sort of sounds like a really late period, like Donde is Kanye beat with the kind of minimalism it of it. But the difference is that Kanye I... would take that lo- loping, repeating sound, and he would just do nothing else it would, that would be the whole song whereas you have all these sort of flourishes the piano, the piano the dun, dun, dun. these different things that are added in that make it feel so much more but anyway you were going to make a donda comparison well not just donda but like the last few kanye records have sort of been like therapy sessions in a way if i were if you were to ask me i know this is an unpopular opinion but of those i would say yay is maybe the most cohesive like delivery of it where it just feels like this specific idea of like like because it's the one that he actually has a conclusion for he's like i know i'm bipolar now and i'm going to talk about like (laughs) i want i want i feel freer now and i want my kids to grow up better than i like with better ideas of their self than i did Um, and if if i can make a loose artistic uh connection here just a comment on that i probably agree that yay is the most kind of like unified in terms of like a single statement on that but the thing about kanye being self-aware in this era is that he's not really he's kind of like he's he's coming to some realizations but no, they're always very shallow fully. it reminds me of like all of <laughs> this this is my my weird uh artistic connection here is that kanye's last few records like as self-aware kind of therapeutic exercises remind me of like uh every season in bojack horseman there's like a moment where bojack kind of realizes he's how fucked up he is and how much he needs to make a change but he doesn't fully realize what he needs to do until like the very end of the show and like yeah no. he, kendrick is the person who realizes what he's what's flawed about him and also like is able to extrapolate that to a wider sort of socio-cultural lens and actually is, is self-effacing like actually gets what it needs to be done to you know the, redeem himself in- without kind of being you know too self-deprecating either like he, he actually understands how to be compelling about that in a way, it feels like the better version of the Life of Pablo in a way. Like if you compare it to like, it has similar beats like on Life of Pablo, you have FML where like he just admits to stuff that you're like, whoa, are you sure you want to put that out there? Where it's like, I'm where he basically admits to like, I will go off my meds and scream at people and start cheating on people. And then I will start thinking about like killing myself. And you're like, holy shit, Kanye, are you... Are you sure you want to put this out publicly? And admittedly, that album is way more. Well, I would already say this: the, this Kendrick album feels like messy. It feels like a bit more of a controlled mess. Mm-hmm. I will say Kanye's other output that feel like therapy sessions feel like the therapy sessions that maybe should have, like that haven't yet been turned into an artistic like message. They're just sort of releasing. This There's one feels very little logic to. Kanye sequencing or anything like that like Life of Pablo was an album he just kind of kept chucking songs onto it after it had been yeah released. exactly like, I don't no know why of, St. Pablo is the closer there's no why 30 hours it. is not and even like Donda when you compare Donda to the deluxe edition that came out where he just completely reshuffled the track list on that and it made zero sense whatsoever so he, <laughs> neither where, version of the album makes sense like yeah, I know, but like what, half of the tracks need to be cut like <laughs> whereas with Kendrick here he has this two-part record Record that is clearly divided into these two separate halves right they have the same I number mean, of tracks they have a mirroring structure to, to a certain extent um and and there's an actual feeling of progression that's not perfect as you kind of highlighted but there is a sense of linearity in terms of like yeah uh recovering and getting better is in a straight line but there is a sense of the progression and of the development here and when you arrive yeah. at the end it feels you feel cleansed and and that's yeah. meaningful because of the way it's set up and, and structured it it's very interesting in a lot of ways it from i feel like a lot of people are taking this album a little too like literally at points like i think the thing we have to remember it's like the same way as i try to tell people about like damn like i was watching uh uh, was it uh, Anthony's uh, review of this album Anthony Fantano's review of this album and comparing it to uh 
to Dam. And it was very interesting to me that I feel like he gave some opinions on on Dam in its comparison. Like, I feel like it kind of chastised the album for something it wasn't trying to do. Like he's like, well, the theme, well, the the themes on Dam that like they're the titles are named after, they're not really discussed in the songs. And I'm like, no, he uses that idea as a jumping off point for the idea of what his character is going through and in and integrates that instead of that emotion, taking it into a different context of the emotion. While this record very much so, I feel like some people are trying to interpret a song like We Cry Together as like this literal portrayal of his marriage or something when it's not that. It's a portrayal. I mean, literally in the song, he says like he's broke, like they say that he's broke. So it's clearly not someone, the marriage that he's had for the last like few years. Like it's clearly him in a relationship much earlier or some or something that he's watched someone else go through or and i don't like think he's saying version of like yeah like, and i also don't think it's him saying this is what a normal relationship is like i think he's very much saying this was a codependent relationship that could fuck up someone's trauma which immediately is followed by your tap da- dancing around the issue like yeah. like the idea of like yes that fucked you up but what is the actual core of what you're discussing instead of just telling me something that happened to you you can't just focus on that moment you have to look more internally Mm -hmm. that's where a song like father uh father time comes in where it's just so first of all an amazing instrumental but secondly like it it feels so honest in a way that like you almost don't expect in a way like because he's talked about his father before and stuff like that it's never been this like brutal towards his father like this is very critical of how he was raised and things like that like you listen to a song like Duckworth and it seems like he has a bit of reverence for his father or uh nostalgia uh off Pusha T's uh, my name is my name like mm. you you expect there to be that there and it's sort of like no like there's a criticalness here and the same thing happens all throughout the album with both himself and other people and by the time you get to stuff like count me out and you get to the second half of the album it's very interesting to see how it develops into that it's this idea of just as you mentioned a sort of cleansing and if we're gonna have to talk about that we might have to talk about the biggest elephant in the room when it comes to this album Am I fair to move on to that point? Because I feel like this is appropriate time to talk about it. It is appropriate, to be honest. And the thing is, like, uh, the final stretch of this record um, and song. I I disagree with people when, uh, what is it, when when Morgan and Jake said the second half was maybe the weakest. I actually think it might be the most important theme-wise. Like, it's the one that left, like, maybe it's not the one that I returned to the tracks the most from. But it's the one that like hit me the most. I like think it's the, the last, one that the last five songs in particular. When from Savior onwards, once you get to that point, I think there's maybe the, the few Savior, songs before that are a bit less essential. But Savior, I think, is the point where the record kind of finally kicks into its third act, more or less. And Kendrick starts directly confronting head on some of the I mean things- Savior specifically has some of the most interesting comments, like the idea of like if the man who invented heart transplants was a murderer, would you still refuse a heart? Like this idea of like, there's this like, yes, we should, as he mentions in the song we're about to talk about, Auntie Diaries, like there's still this idea of like, you should be responsible. You should know what words are. Obviously the comparison track on the early album is like, oh, everyone's too sensitive on worldwide steppers. And you get to this track, Auntie's Diaries, and he's like, no, that was bravado. Yeah, well, that that's the all... thing. Like, it's part of the develop the narrative arc and the development of Kendrick's character on this yeah. album is that he starts in that. And sort of Savior, Savior, sort of the middling point where he's like, "We have to recognize like people make mistakes. What mistakes are you willing to put up with? Like, for certain aspects. Like, are you okay with? Like, we can say Thomas Edison was a like terrible person. Are you going to give up your phone? Like, you know, like there's certain stuff that you just have to admit to yourself. Like, yeah, there's certain stuff that you have to just look inward and think like, what is proportional for me to do? Mm. And it's a sort of idea where he's not like, don't you don't have to forgive these people. You can still be critical of these people, but you have to recognize that you can never live a fully pure lifestyle of this stuff because bad people exist everywhere. And there's going to be mistakes that happen everywhere. And then you get into Auntie Diaries, as I guess we're going to really talk about. I will say this this song, as I think I said on Twitter, this this has it's I really like this song, 
but it also has very much the energy of like when I came out to my family and my aunt gave my mom a copy of the National Geographic that's like the trans America like it has that vibe where you're like you're like you're you're trying you're not there yet but you're trying like you're like this is a really honest and it's purposely messy well here's the thing right and kind of word this in a way I'll, I'll just say what I'm thinking which might sound a bit inflammatory but I'm actually glad the song is made the way that it is because oh, no, I am too because I think and this is I'm not the first person to say this I think this is a song that will get through for starters it's not a song made for trans people it's not a song about Kendrick saying no I embrace they think it's made for Kendrick no exactly but it, it's, it's also made for people I don't think who, he thinks this is a grand statement I think this is him talking to himself about what he's done and also i guess trying to project a message that is ultimately positive through to the people who need to hear it the most potentially yeah which is people who may potentially still harbor some bigotry and the thing that kendrick understands or people that he may have hurt in the past yes exactly and the thing that kendrick understands is that bigotry is not always a conscious decision bigotry is internalized uh, prejudice and certain views about you know, gender and sexuality are internalized deeply and they are not necessarily this you know it's not necessarily that everyone who behaves in certain ways that are you know not affirming of, of trans or non-binary people come from a place of malice it can often be and probably more often than we may realize a place of a lack of understanding and a lack of preparation to understand and so I think that this song functions beautifully as something that I imagine I, I'm hopeful it's certainly one of my favorite songs on the record I, I'm imagine and I'm hopeful that this song will help a lot of people who are in that place of not understanding but not you know, feeling outwardly hateful, but just feeling kind of overwhelmed by a, a world of uh, experience and an and actual kind of subjective reality that they are not equipped or familiar to understand. I hope that this will, and I believe that this will help people to begin to make that step towards understanding and that start having some very difficult but necessary conversations. Absolutely. And again, you're right. It's about Kendrick for sure. But I think he understands that and I think especially through the final yeah. part of the song where he talks about this conversation that he's had where, it, you know, the, the hypocrisy of his belief with regard to, you know, who can and can't say uh, certain slurs yeah. is kind of contextualized by how other certain slurs are used. Which I want to be clear, I think he's saying in that song, I don't think in that song he's saying, so white people are allowed to say the N-word. I think it's no, him saying, God, no. oh, he, no. No, 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 no. I think some people interpret it that way, but those are bad well, it's just not I think it's him saying... Like, yeah. we should not be saying the f slur if we're not gay anymore is more what he was saying <laughs> obviously like i think that again this is where actual reading comprehension and engagement is important this is because... this i i this is why when i see people on twitter complaining like oh you have to read a dictionary to understand kendrick which i'm like no he's no, you don't. pretty you just have to he's listen. not aesop rock like he's not <laughs> saying anything like he's he's not using a thesaurus a lot like these are pretty understandable concepts it's just mm. the idea of like him i think that's what kind of as we mentioned earlier like same love like comparing it to something like that i think that's sort of what makes the song so interesting compared to another rapper's sort of rejection of homophobia is this idea of like it's not a message song it is him apologizing it is a it is about him but it is about him learning from it and it's not about getting other people to agree with him it's about him, it's about him releasing his own mistakes out there it's about and through that you know you compare that to other songs about it where straight people are talking about like oh we should give these gays the rights blah 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 like those feel very much like self-aggrandizing they feel like you're putting themselves up and saying like i am raising the community behind me with my arms well, this one feels like no i'm actually giving reparations to the community like apologies mm. for what i've done in the past and letting them speak for themselves and i will only speak about my experiences separately it is definitely a track that still made me though want to walk up to and be like hey i should explain some of these terms to you though yeah. i will say something that helped was a tweet by uh i was trying to fd signifier great video essayist check out his work he's great uh on twitter yes, about this where fan. he reacted and he was talking about like 
you know, when it comes to the pronoun thing, like a lot of us may have heard like Demetrius is Marianne now wondered why he never used the pronoun she and only used he. And he explained to me that a lot of older black queer queer folk are very any all with their with their you know pronouns. It's a very like it's a very like radical queerness, this idea of like I I like this opening identity of like. I experience so much of this that I let, and like, I, I allow my identity to be fluid. And it's something that I was not, uh, you know, in the culture of to be able to discuss that, like, it, it, it made it very interesting to re-listen to it and realize like, okay, this wasn't like a mistake. It might be actually how this person identifies. Absolutely. And I think like one of the things that Kendrick kind of, I think wants us to understand as well as like, and one of the things that people on Twitter maybe have a bad tendency of doing is kind of like inserting themselves into the experience or into art where they may tangentially belong, but may not fully completely be able to understand. And I think that ties back into the, again, the specifically the black trans experience, which is the experience that Kendrick is speaking about coming to understand yeah. in this song as well. So that's an important well, thing to pick up on as well. That, that's interesting because it also explores black Christianity and a lot of that stuff yes. where it's a very different form of it, where people can be both very devout, but also sort of torn between issues as this cultural minority, where it's mm. not going to be as easy to understand your way through things when the like Christian narrative fits it so well of like we are the chosen ones we are the ones on top and you can yeah. see it when how we're treated that's yeah. less seen in black cultures and it's very interesting to see him discuss it that way mm. and I mean there's so m I, I will say like obviously if you're listening to this and you're saying I felt uncomfortable listening to it I don't want to listen to it that's fair enough I think that's a fair decision Obviously, we're not going to sit here and tell you how to feel on anything. That is not what this is about. But it is an experience that I think is worthwhile in there. I think his use of the slur is obviously him saying like, hey, this is how it was thrown around. We need to be honest about that. And even if you feel differently about like us, about if he should have said it or should have said something different in his place, I will say is objectively a little bit funny the way he says it. Uh, he just says it so quickly. He yeah. says it so quickly. <laughs> and I, I still love my tweet about, uh, was it hit, like Soundwave looking at him like, you got anything for day? And just Kendrick in the studio with the meme of just, I have a homophobic slur to say. Look, but again, I, I don't think... think that's how he was. I think it's clearly meant to be a commentary. Mm -hmm. And if you feel uncomfortable with it, I'm not going to blame you. Yeah, for sure. Like, again, I think that Alice, you... while I understand not wanting to listen to the song for those reasons. I also feel as though some conversations can trivialize it. And I don't enjoy the way oh, yeah. that, that, you know, that context and that the significance of what's happening kind of gets reduced. And that's just a, a fact. That's just a function of what Twitter is. But well, the first hour, it was like people were trying to cancel him for it. The second hour, people finally realized what it was. Yeah. There's still a few people I know who are not big fans of it. And I understand. And that's fair. I, I know yeah. a few black trans women who are like, I wish this was addressed differently, but that's their own experiences that they're discussing. Mm -hmm. And I can't comment on that. And I've seen some white trans women who made them pop shots at it. I, I do understand how some of them could read in the idea of like, oh, they're weird, but I love them. But I don't think that's what he was going for. No. But I understand how someone could, <laughs> could get that because that's sort of what half of pretty much all queer songs written about written by straight people are well, like we want to talk and about even though i don't think this one is it's understandable for people to react that way because it's they're so used to it well if we want to talk about like how empathetic and genuinely understanding kendrick is to the people closest to him then we have to talk about mother i sober right how can Best you listen track on the album in my opinion yeah same here i agree how can you listen to this and then go back to Andy Dyer's and think, oh, Kendrick has no compassion for these people that he's singing about. Like, obviously he has yeah. a lot of love and care. I mean, Mother I Sober is just an absolutely gut-wrenching and beautiful and intense and, and powerful song about institutionalized abuse and sexual abuse and, and institutionalized racism and all these kinds of different factors, how they factor into an environment where Kendrick behaves the way he does, where people like Kodak Black and, and other people might behave the way that they, they do. Again, not excusing those behaviors, but helping to understand and explain them, helping to understand the difficult and institutionalized. Again, he uses some very 
inflammatory language on here talking about you know a systematic raping that essentially uh, black people are are have thrust upon them and then are forced to engage in on a metaphorical level and sometimes on a not metaphorical level like he uses that really violent and powerful imagery to try and communicate through to the listener exactly how real and intense and foreign to a lot of these listeners the the conditions that lead to flawed human beings, misunderstood human beings, uh, problematic and, and difficult and dangerous human beings, like, and human beings at the end of the day, like, it goes so much deeper than that. I, I don't mean to interrupt, sorry, but no, I was going to say, it's very interesting to compare it to something like Dam. Like, if Dam is him analyzing himself, like, and his experiences and who he might be, this is him uncovering deep traumatic stuff that he hasn't thought about in a while and he's put off and that he's been trying to forget like this is the deepest of the deep stuff yeah, and it's I mean, very interesting to compare this to a track like fear off damn where it's like this yeah. very this idea of just like what has shaped me what has scared me and you know it's a very similar idea to fear where it's like this idea of like I, you know, I, I, I'm afraid of letting people down. I'm afraid of what society has made me. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. And this is sort of the idea of like, what have I been covering up my entire life? What have I been dealing with? What are the, all these people around me dealing with? And it's this unspoken thing that a lot of people, you think about how common a lot of sexual assault is like mm. that. It's just not talked about a lot, particularly in masculine circles where it's very it, it's not in all circles it's very ashamed about because you talk about women and there's always a misogynist element to it you talk about with men there's a toxic masculinity element of it where people assume that this is some failing of your gender when in reality it's just something that happens and it's a very very personal way of talking about it. the way he literally says out loud like i know this has happened to some of the people some of the rappers that i talk to every other rapper is, is the phrase he yeah uses. um which obviously that could be metaphorical because there's certain aspects where people could say that like the, the black community has had traumas that are similarly deep red but like you get the idea of like no this is much more common than people realize and that's this is why there's such this bravado added to people and while it is something that still appears in obviously white culture, there's still a lot of, I don't know why I said pronounce the H in there like I was from the South, but uh, a lot of white culture, like, you know, there's still like toxic masculinity and stuff, but there's a lot more on the line for black people in regards to this issue and uh, black men on this issue specifically. Mm -hmm. So he's basically having to call out like, this is something that we need to address as a society and we need to realize and deal with ourselves and what our relationship it is because it's going to haunt us and it's very interesting to see how honest his ep is and especially the way it builds slowly and almost like he just starts screaming at the end like this well, raps like he's been whispering and then all of a sudden he starts delivering it in the same tone that he did on like good kid mad city yeah. or mm -hmm. to pimp butterfly where he's just like it's like shouting from a pulpit and mm -hmm. it's like this idea of like i've gotten the revelation i've realized what i need to do to myself to like learn and it's that i am flawed and it's that i am but i can still learn to love myself and it's very interesting that that's it's a great way to sort of finish the concept of the album and it's not even just self-love either like the, the climax of the song is about kind of Kendrick engaging in a personal exercise for him, which is to try and use his music to set free people of the pain that they carry, both abused and abusers. Like, it's quite meaningful that he ends the song with, I set free all of you abusers, this is transformation. Like, it's this idea, and again, it gets to the crux of what Kendrick is doing with this entire album, which is kind of like radical humanization, is how I would describe this. I believe he says at one point in the album, I think it's the line uh, in the valley where hurt people hurt people. <laughs> that was on Heart Part 5 uh, when he was... Oh, uh, God damn it. Yeah, yeah. But this, it's the same sort of thing, right? He just wants uh, he, he wants there to be a bigger part of the conversation. And again, he ties this specifically into the Black experience. He wants there to be a bigger part of the conversation that acknowledges how hurt and pain is passed down. And, and it's um, weird how it's almost an inverse of I in a way. Like I was him trying to speak about loving himself 
And then he ends it by having to talk to the community about how to love themselves. Like he's originally speaking to everyone like at the end, like, hey, I absolve you. I absolve you. And then the next song is I chose me. And it's Mm -hmm. I chose self-love. And it's this idea of like, I chose to be the savior for everyone. And I'm realizing that I can't always be that. So I'm going to learn to love myself too. And I hope you all can follow that. Mm. And instead of being a savior, I can be a model. Yeah. And I mean, again, just to, as like a final twist of the knife as well, like when the song ends and you get the I choose me, it's not Kendrick's voice you hear saying that. It's Kodak Black's. Again, that final equating of the two of them. Again, Kendrick, again, radical humanization. Kendrick is really making you think about what he's trying to do in the most difficult way possible. And then, yeah, Mirror, like, gives you that kind of cathartic ending, that feeling of, like, after Mother I Sober, it's like taking a, a breath or, like, stepping into the Mother sunlight. I Sober, I, I compare it to fear. It's also sort of the sing about me, I'm dying of thirst yeah. sort of element. And this is, like, the real, um, is, is that what you're saying? Well, it's very much, like, not just because it's a longer song that's very personal, but it's this idea of, like, sing sing about me dying of thirst is very much also like this feeling of like i i i I want my legacy to be better than my mistakes i want to be able to reach out to people and do something and this is and it's sort of him realizing like i need to reach out to myself so it's a very interesting companion to this i as i think i've i've come to the understanding this album is very much not only companion to the rest of his career but definitely companion to damn Hmm. for sure i mean if you if you were to take the tracks of the second half and just put them in between the put them in between the first half, it would just be the same structure as Dan. Yeah. Like, and it's very interesting to see this idea. Obviously, it's it's a very messy album. It's one that leaves you feeling weird at very certain points. There's some lines that make you listen to it and you go, I don't know about that one, Kendrick, but <laughs> <laughs> you understand it's like there's the line of a uh, you know, as I mentioned, like the everyone's too sensitive or he, but he says like, oh, who cares about cancel culture? I'll say anything I want. And I'm just sort of like, is that you playing a character or do well, you genuinely I think he's just believe it? I think he's questioning the construct. And I think he's he's yeah. trying to get the, the listener to think about how socially constructed these things are, how things like cancel culture or things like, you know, the rules we set in place for who can and can't have a voice are not these hard coded like inherent things, they are socially constructed. And he wants you to think about that. I feel like I'm taking a sociology class every time I listen to a Kendrick Lamar album. Um, I'm curious- I mean, but that's the thing, like, yeah, it's 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 something like I, the worst take I saw before the Kendrick album drop was someone be like, oh, uh, you guys are always so mad that someone doesn't want to look at it and like, re- like hear about all the problems in the world and all the serious stuff instead of just listen to a party album whenever someone says they're not- feeling Kendrick and I'm like well no but this art is important to exist and it's very important to do it well and it's worth discussing and obviously some people will will take the wrong I I did make fun of on Twitter I eventually deleted it but like the people who did the most surface level analysis of the cover where they're like oh well the broken down house represents instability and I'm like this is obviously going to be a very obvious metaphor for what the album's actually talking about. And sure enough, it's like if you did a thing about like to film Butterfly's cover where you're like, man, this is about black empowerment. And it's like, yeah, we have eyes. And it's clear that you can make fun of Kendrick, people who listen to Kendrick and only take away the most surface level of stuff. But there is a lot here. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what has made him such an interesting artist. As I said, like, he's had five albums. And if I'm being honest, like, I don't know if it's just, I feel like, I was going to say hip hop, but I think it's in general, every, every, a lot of artists, like usually if you don't start off on the rougher end or something like that, you usually put out at least one album that is less than great. And if I'm going to be honest, I'm going to spoil a little bit of my rating here. I don't think he's put out any album that's less than great. Every single album I give in at least an eight out of 10 to. Like, and this is like, it, I, 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 I think that's partially because he's so willing to like just look at himself analyze things that are going on and it's not just like he's able to communicate these complex ideas and still like make it feel relatable Mm -hmm. and it's it's one of those great things where I feel like a lot of 
a lot of artists, specifically in conscious hip hop, like stumble on about trying to figure out how to deliver their messages. And it feels like that's what makes him so special. It's not that he's uniquely the most intelligent man to ever rap. It is him basically being like, I, I, I'm going through this. I'm going to talk it with you. I'm going to learn about this. I'm going to discuss this with you. And like not having it be like from a pulpit or anything like that. I mean, he does scream from a pulpit sometimes, but it's less like I, he's looking down on you and more the idea of like someone speaking out the truth from there. Mm. It's mutual and, understanding that I think he's trying to get across. Like, I want you to understand me better and I want to be able to understand you better through this process. Even though art seems like a one directional thing, it's... I believe it's a mutual thing. I believe that you get as much from this as I get from your engagement with it. And it's kind of like a really, like, again, with mirror, right? It's the idea that Kendrick is holding up this mirror of himself, that this version of himself that is the same, but is filtered through his art. And it lets you sort of see this and it lets you see yourself in it as well. And it's, yeah, it's a beautiful like way of capping off the record with, with musing on that statement. I'm curious about your thoughts on the refrain of I choose me, I'm sorry. Like, what do you think the significance is of making that assertion, uh, but also apologizing in the same uh, in the same breath over and over and over? Well, I mean, there's the the line, uh, I think it's on the opening of Savior, where it's the line of Kendrick, Kendrick inspired you to, uh, I need to remember the exact phrasing. I, uh, Kendrick made savior. you think about it, but he is not your savior. Cole made you feel empowered that he's not your savior. Future said, get a money Future counter. Future said, get a money counter. Yeah. This idea of I'm not your is savior. So why yeah, is he okay, apologizing yeah, then for, for choosing himself? I think it's because he wants to, to know, like people want him to be this thing to pick them up and be that person for them. And he needs to tell them like, I can't, I need to do this for myself. You need to do this for yourself. Mm. And I know that I'm going to be disappointed by disappointing you by admitting that, by saying that I have to go through this. Everyone wants me to be the Tupac. But Tupac ended up going through a lot of stuff that he didn't discuss publicly. And he didn't get to live to see his full life because of it. He ended up getting involved in, you know, the, the, the rap beefs that ended up, you know, painting our entire discussion of late 90s rap beefs in this horrib horrifying light. And it's him basically saying like, if we have this idealized version of what you want me to be, and it doesn't, it's impossible. Mm. And I, I, I know it's going to hurt for me to say that. And I know that it's going to hurt for me to just release this album that's going to be very honest and messy and probably leave a lot of the, uh, the, <laughs> the white kid Kendrick fans very confused um, who are not into his more weird stuff, but who really really like uh are the same people who are like yeah but humble slaps you know like instead yeah. of talking about the thieves of damn you know who I will think, say um, i listened to him butterfly less because they don't like how weird and jazzy it is <sighs> like it's gonna confuse those people yeah but he doesn't care like yeah. as i think people are pointing out like someone said like oh he didn't sell as much as drake well he didn't want to sell a lot of albums with this one he wanted to make this for himself mm. and i think that's the thing about this album it very much doesn't feel like him saying like i need to be the this great on top of the world this this the king of rap like thing is like no i'm gonna be the best i can be and you guys are going to either come with me or you're going to not like it but I'm going to make what I want. And it's this idea of like, I'm sorry that it's not going to fit some of you. Yeah. I'm sorry that I can't be what you want me to be, but I choose that what's going to make me happy. It doesn't feel like a kind of like hollow. In apology. an ironic sense, it fits very well into a trance reading. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel like a hollow apology in Kendrick's case either. Like he feels like he's no. saying genuinely, I choose me and genuinely, I'm sorry. He's making an assertion. I mean, I just himself. made the comparison to transness. It reminds me of like when I came out and I'm like, listen, I know you had all these ex expectations in me. I'm sorry that I can't be that. Yeah, it's time that was very genuine. Yeah. And it was like this idea. But in the end, I knew what was right for me. Yeah. And in the end, now if someone made me apologize for myself, I'd say, fuck you. And I'm sure that's kind of going to be what he feels mm -hmm. in a few years from now when he's when this is all settled and he's like, 
I'm no longer feel like this weight is on my back. And he can finally say, mm -hmm. if you expect this of me, I feel more confident now, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. Just I mean, you look back to you, I mentioned it earlier, how what an amazing song it is. I feel like a lot of people glossed over that he literally admits to being suicidal on there. Like mm -hmm. that's not, like he doesn't say depressed. He says, I am thinking about dying. He literally says you cannot cure, a, money can't cure a suicidal weakness. And it's like, it's very clear, this man needed therapy. <laughs> yeah. And like, I he think- He made therapy to... so mad, he made a two, two, <laughs> it's a two disc album about it. <laughs> yeah. I think to, to wrap a bow on it, like with that line, I choose me, I'm sorry. I think my kind of, it's like, it's the ultimate capstone because it is an assertion of self-worth, but equally it's an acknowledgement of everyone else around him. Like it is- Yeah asserting oneself but in the same breath it is acknowledging the people around his him. mistakes and, his and, and it kind mistakes. of just brings it all together because it shows that and i think this is kendrick's message and it's a particularly important one when it comes to kind of like uh, masculine and emotional reconciliation which is that to understand and make concessions and make an attempt to view the world through the perspectives of, of the people around you does not mean you have to sacrifice your own sense of self-worth or your own sense of integrity and that's a fundamental misunderstanding I think a lot of people have that they need to work through which is this idea well I can't show this kind of weakness or I can't show this kind of compassion because if I do that it reduces my sense of self it makes it makes it it's me kind of you know, being self-deprecating to the extent that I'm kind of reducing my own self-worth. And Kendrick here is saying, no, that's not, that's not how it has to be. And that I think is the most powerful takeaway from this entire record is Kendrick's Absolutely. strong communication of the idea that you can show compassion, you can reach out to the people around you and be compassionate and be understanding and, and acknowledge, you know, the things that you've done that have helped and harmed and all these sorts of things without reducing your sense of uh, what we would New Zealand would call mana, your sense of self-worth, your sense of integrity, your sense of humanity. And that is so core. And that's why I really appreciate this record existing. And I am glad that we were able to have a real genuine conversation about it, not just a Twitter thread. Let's do our favorite tracks, uh, three favorite tracks, least favorite track and rating out of 10. Uh, we've already had some. So Jake gave it a seven. Morgan gave it an eight. My three favorite tracks are going to be uh, United in Grief, uh, Mother I Sober, and Savior. Uh, my least favorite track on the record is probably, um, hmm, that's actually really tough. I, I probably would say actually- Same. It has a, I, we didn't even talk about it at all. It has a great verse from Ghostface Killer on it, but I really don't care. Oh, Ghostface is heart, great. Uh, that much. It's probably my least favorite. Um, but his verse is, to being his, one of my... his verse is deranged, <laughs> though. I really appreciate it. Um, he As sounds, all Ghostface verses are. <laughs> he sounds like he's literally like being tortured. Uh, anyway, uh, this album uh, was, and this is a positive rating, mind you. It was very much like sitting in around a 6.5 sort of area. I'm going to bump it to a seven because I think that it, it really deserves that. For me, that's quite close to being a really great record, but it's still really? a very, very good one. Uh, I'm intrigued because I didn't think I was going to be the person to have the most positive well, opinion on we the album. Um, but anyway, that's my rating. Uh, Emily, your turn. Uh, so my big three favorite tracks are Mother I Sober, Father Time, and I'm going to go with Count Me Out, but Purple Hearts is just right there too. Count Me Out and Purple Hearts are a great way to finish off that first half of the album. Count Me Out's really and, fun because I was just saying to Jake in the group DM uh, this morning that it it's basically sounds like a Brockhampton song. <laughs> well, it's also him basically just like, it's the perfect lead into the next half yeah. of the album because it's him saying, all right, I'm done with all of this. I've, I'm going to be honest, like with how imperfect I've been. And yeah. it feels it feels like a very interesting way of delivering it. And I mm -hmm. really enjoy it. And my least favorite track, if I had to say, I guess it's a Die Hard. Um, again, like I, I think it's more just the place in the album and just I'm not a big fan of the instrumental. But even then, like it's not a song I hate either. There's there there's certainly been Kendrick songs on Kendrick albums that I've liked even more than this that I hated more. Uh, mm. Looking at you, Compton and Real. Those are very that's a very weak way to close oh, out good kid, disagree, in my opinion. Fine. Okay, I'll let um, you have that that score. And uh honestly. 
I'm going to give this a nine out of 10. It's a very low nine. Yeah. But it's a, it's a nine because I genuinely, like we talked about it for so long. There's mm-hmm. so much to dig into the film and you kind of have to appreciate that. And yeah. I also give section 80, like a, like eight out of 10. And I think this album's better than section 80. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you're right. We talked about so much and yet it feels like there's so much we didn't even get to talk about. We didn't about. really say much negative about it either in our discussion. Well, like we what, could have. And one we thing didn't I will really. say is I do think there are songs here that are lacking instrumentally for me. I don't like, as I said, I don't really care for Purple Hearts. I think that's a little bit too kind of not, a little bit too sort of cloudy for me. And, and, and I didn't really feel there. for Die Hard's instrumental. You didn't really feel for Die Hard, which is fair enough. Uh, there's Crown a, Hill's instrumental Crown, is kind Crown of is, I, I appreciate the minimalism of Crown, but it's just a song that's like, should be half of its length. And it's also weirdly positioned as the second I track. I think I enjoyed it more on second listen. Uh, but I will say there are songs here where I like the instrumental more so than the, the content. Uh, like Silent Hill I think I love the really kind of bullet piercing track beats on that track and how kind of loud and like really abrasive they are Uh, while it's still got this kind of like sort of atmospheric vibe to it too I really like the instrumental on Rich Spirit even though that's not a hugely substantive song for me I, I just really like the instrumental shout out to the Alchemist beat on We Cry Together fantastic beat uh, obviously, Be to go. It's such a great track. Great I, track. I, I don't even view agree. it as a skit. Like I would listen to it. Like I'd listen to it in the same way I'd listen to something like you, yes. where it's not something you just put on randomly. But when you listen to it, it's like an experience. Yeah, and, and that, I don't that, think it's. I don't think it's fair to say it's not a song. I think and, it is. A and song I think that beat way. from Alchemist is just insanely perfect. The way it loops and just oh. becomes like this really kind of monotonously continuous loop in a way that it feels like it mirrors the way the argument is progressing is really great yeah. uh, mr morale i think is a, is a pretty strong track but i definitely think i enjoy it more instrumentally than than substance substantively See, but i'm the opposite i'm not a big fan of his instrumental but i really like its uh, fair lyricism enough. fair enough can't fault that um yeah and i think as i kind of mentioned the first three tracks on the album are basically perfect uh, in my opinion as well even though we didn't touch on them too much so yeah lots to love here I think we've I'm pretty satisfied with our commentary though I think we've really dug out the, the root and the core of yeah. what this album is and, and um, I think this is going to be an album that's uh our uh, people's opinions are going to involve evolve as it, it goes on in the year because yeah. this is a very much one that people are going to be returning to mm-hmm. and it's going to be one that people are going to be figuring out what they feel about it I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if this gets a very negative reappraisal but I also wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of people putting it at the top of their best album of the year list and I don't just mean like Kendrick stands or hip-hop stands I mean like I if this was like at the top of Pitchfork's favorite album of the year or something like that highly doubt that considering I I doubt it but you know what I mean like I feel like some publishers like that publications that may have given it like mixed reviews by the end of the year it might become something of like one of the best albums of the year I think it'll take definitely one of those for this to be yeah. fully uh reappraised like that i think definitely there's a certain reaction to it from the off like very quick snappy reaction to it that's a bit more it, mixed that i think people will come to kind of move it, past it just wouldn't time. surprise me if this has a very similar reaction to like blonde where the first time people heard it they were like well this doesn't sound like channel orange this is not like that and then later on they realized like oh the eccentricities are what makes me love it yeah and anyway this album gets an average rating of 7.8 from the Jams and Tea podcast for Kendrick Lamar's Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. Let us know at home what you think of either of any of the albums that we've discussed today, the big four, but particularly the big ones as well from Kendrick and The Smile, Ethel Kane and Gospel 2. Let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, you can head on over to the YouTube version of the video and the channel and the link in the description. Please consider giving us a like. Please consider subscribing if you have not already. Uh, Leave us a comment too. All of these metrics really help with us with getting the video seen. We'd love to have this one uh, do some decent numbers for us. So uh, if you enjoy the video, please consider sharing it with any of your friends who you think might uh, get something out of it or might enjoy some of the conversation that we've had today. Uh, Obviously as well, Emily was our guest. Thank you again, Emily. I think this is maybe the fourth or fifth time you've joined us and it's always a pleasure to have you. Please fourth. Obviously go and check out Emily's channel as well. I'm going to give it the hearty plug, even though it's doing a lot better than ours is, but we're doing all right. Um, 
Go and check out the, me appearing in the new Renegade cut video helped. Yes. Exactly. Well, go and check out Emily's channel. Go and check out some of the amazing recent videos. The High Life video was amazing. I'm really proud of it. Loved it's, I think it. it's the best thing I've made. And I probably, from what I've seen, I was really, really impressed with it. And I think you're only going from strength to strength with your work as a creator. So I, yeah, yeah you're, you're doing so Next well. Next one's going to be even bigger. And I'm, I'm so excited that people are, are feeling it. Because, I mean, that's the thing, like, I create not just for myself, but I hope that I can inspire other people. And you even if something as little as a YouTube video, like if I can brighten your day for a little bit, or I can intrigue you for like 30, 40 minutes, like I'm happy. If you listen to this podcast and you are happy that I'm on it, then that's great. And if you're unhappy that I'm on it, <laughs> shut up. As always though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Staples. That was easy.